Maybe it goes better if it's closer to the speaker. I never found it. Hey, Thomas, do you know where the WebEx information so I can log in to the WebEx? Do you know where that is? Um, yeah, it should have it, but if you find out, I don't have to find it. I've got so many symposiums. Do you have the information for the meeting? On the general channel? I didn't see it on the general channel. It's in the bookmarks. The bookmarks? Yeah. For the podium, not the. Fine, but you have my slides in the field. Yes, it is. Okay. So, Thomas, like I have everything on the downloads folder. Do you want me to move this to somewhere else? So, there we go. I'll just like check this right okay. now. So, let's see. Live show. Max, so it should be okay, but you never know. There we go. And then let's see where this is. Looks good. Everything looks great. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Great. Can you, can you put it in full screen mode? I just want to make sure it's sharing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's sharing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. It's sharing the right thing. And uh, what, what did Sherita say when you spoke? I don't think she said that. Yeah, yeah, when there's lots of people speaking. E R F M, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I suppose this. No. No worries. We are not able to do a presentation mode on keyboard, keynote or not. I'm sorry, Matilda, can you speak again? Matilda, can you speak? She's speaking. Are you using the mic? Yeah, it's just that this noise is hard to tell. Yeah. There is a quiet place. Is there a quiet place I can go? Uh, the speaker is there. Matilda, this is Thomas. Can you hear me? Matilda? Hello? Asking if you can hear. Uh, yeah, Thomas. Yeah, I was saying, can, can, can Matilda speak using the mic? I just want to confirm that I, I can hear her using the mic. Mic, mic, mic. Speaker will be here. Yes. Yeah, I could hear that. Oh. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? General channel or in the section? No, in the section channel. Sorry. So that we don't bother everyone. Let me move the mic a little closer, but I could hear her. So Thomas, Matilde has been speaking on the mic as well. Can you hear her? Uh, you, you, you may have to ask the speakers to, to speak closer to where you are. 
Okay. I'll, I'll come over. Okay. So Thomas, like we'll just keep this open. I'm going to close the box folder. So we just keep this downloads, okay? Sure. Because it, because like, uh, do you want to move this to like the actual assembly? Yes, we can do it on tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So for now, time being, yeah, exactly. I will manage this because I know what's happening. Yeah. Then we can have the speakers not to go too far from there. Let me make sure that. I'm yeah, the thing is, like, the speakers will be here. Yes. So, so I'll try. Sure. No, it's fifteen minutes waiting here. So, uh, by it. So the invite is 20 minutes. Uh, so next day is going to be 30 minutes. So one to two. Uh, 25. 25. So it's going to be 12 plus. Yeah. So we just managed to set this up. So I wasn't much of a yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm so used to it. Is there a remote button? To yes, there is, there's a clicker. Okay. Right. Okay. I think it's right. Excuse me, Captain. Excuse me, Captain. When I move on the side, I just want to make sure that the camera is going in. Excuse me, the side. Yes, I'm able to get it. Okay, I'm, re I'm recording it live streaming, so I'm recording it live streaming, so yeah. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be opening this fantastic annual Simpson Spring Symposium. Recipes to regulate star formation at all scales from the nearby universe to the first galaxies. Um, and it's a real pleasure to see all of you here, especially post COVID. It's great to have these in person meetings and, and great to get together. And welcome to everybody who's listening in online. Um, I want to have a special shout out to all of our organizers, um, our co chairs, Deshaun Kakad and Matilda Ngozi. Um, thank you so much for your, all of your work and for everyone on the Scientific Organizing Committee. Uh, putting this conference together, selecting the speakers and the talks. I know from experience that that's a tremendous amount of work. Um, and looking at the agenda, I'm just really excited to see all of the, the talks that are coming this week. Um, I also want to say a thank you to the local organizing committee and thanks to everybody you're up here. And a special shout out to our events uh, planning committee, our group here at Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, this meeting was a little challenging because it came right after a power shutdown that we had over the weekend. Um, so a little bit of last minute scrambling and we really wanted to make sure that your talks today would not be disturbed by say a fire alarm, which happened earlier today. <laughs> um, so thank you all for your, your patience and flexibility of being here today. And we look forward to seeing you back over at the Global System Scope Science uh, post of building tomorrow. Um, you know, as we approach the start of the JST cycle three, um, and you know, we've just had to call for proposals for Hubble cycle 32, it's really impressive to see how the power of these two telescopes working together uh, with ground based facilities, with other multi wavelength facilities, are able to answer fundamental questions about how stars form and evolve over cosmic time. And you know the Hubble TV program in the seats has now wrapped up its thousand orbits of observations to obtain UV spectroscopy with cosmos disk for a whole bunch of nearby stars. Um, got a very powerful legacy data set, which is not going to be matched by any other telescope at any time in the next decade. Um, I'm, I'm particularly excited to see all the spectra of high redshift galaxies coming out of James Webb. Uh, the idea that we can get a mini detailed spectra of galaxies at range 10, 11, and 12, and maybe pushing 13. That's such a fundamental game changer. And comparing those spectra to the things that we see in the local universe is just an amazing, amazing connection over cosmic time. Um, and Hubble and Webb together have mapped uh, the amazing uh, nearby FANG galaxy survey mapping out dust of star forming regions and stellar populations, showing the power of the ultraviolet and infrared working together to fully probe and be So this is an amazing breadth of, of progress that's been made um, just in the last few years. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the talks and discussions that happen at this conference and the ideas that are going to arise from the, the things that we discuss at the coffee and dinner that's going to lead to the next set of great observations and next papers. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our organizers to say a few words, but let me again say welcome. I'm so glad you're here and uh, thank you for all the fantastic work you've been doing. Everyone for being in the introduction of this conference, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so this is a, um, a great opportunity, like the Spring Symposium in general, and the telescope are a great opportunity to gather um, bigger science groups of people who usually don't don't work on the same on the same on the exact same topic. They are 
uh, the distinction about the public focus on improved uh, um, on, it, on improved, let's say, uh, science than uh, very focused meetings. And this is the reason why we organized this, uh, this symposium. Um, I will just change slide. So, the reason why, there is, well, what we expect from this week. Is uh, now that uh, here in this room we are uh, gathering the people who work in the low redshift, cosmic moon, and high redshift, uh, working both on observations and simulation. We know that it would be possible to discuss uh, together about the effects that uh, and the conditions that are affecting star formation across cosmic time. So you will hear about different uh, different talks based on different, like uh, based on all these uh, different. Um, Different scales, different special scales, and different and different redshifts. Um, this is uh, quite important now since uh, the, uh, the the understanding of uh, the uh, the understanding of the processes that are affecting our evolution uh, is one of the also important priority area, and we are expecting in the next few years uh, now that we have JWST and with the amazing telescopes uh, that uh, will be. Uh, that, that, that are part that are about come with the ERPs and so on. Um, we will be able to understand more and more what is going on and on the redshifts. Um, and uh, so this is uh, this is the reason why uh, you are only here and uh, this uh, will be a big symposium. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, participation. Um, this is the this is how the week will be uh, organized. Today, of course, we are here at the colonnade and we are starting the first session that is about the conditions for star formation in galaxies and the role of cause and the role of stellar feedback. This session will end up tomorrow morning, and then tomorrow we start the second session that will be uh, focused on the relationship between the star formation and mechanical evolution. Then on Wednesday and Thursday, we will study, we will look more about the CGM and IGM role in shaping star formation. Uh, activity in galaxies, and then we will end up by on Thursday and Friday um, looking at the role of EGM feedback in regulating star formation. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, in case you want to have a look at the latest schedule, uh, please use this QR code, or you can just uh, directly use the website that is given at the at the top of the agenda uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the website. So. Uh, in addition to science discussions, we will also have a workshop at the end of the week. So on Friday afternoon, uh, we will have a wonderful set of workshops uh, by the fans group uh, led by David Pilko uh, on uh, on uh, uh, on basically like exploring fans data, like from HST, JWST, Alma, Muse. So a lot of data that you'll be able to use uh, to say derive uh, ISM properties and so on and so forth. Uh, and the same uh, and a similar uh, uh, presentation will be given by Ryan Sanders on the derivation of gas properties with the cosmic noon using PyNet. So Ryan Sanders is also in the audience right now. Uh, then we will have a presentation by Travis Fisher on ex uh, on exploiting the Hubble advanced science products. So if you don't want to reduce Hubble data, you can just directly visit this workshop and find out how to use Hubble data uh, and get like super amazing coordinate spectra already. And lastly, we always think about how can we use simulations to do our science? Like, you know, you, you hear about science, but how do we how do we do that science actually? How do we explore simulations directly? So there will be a presentation or a workshop by Ray and uh, uh, as well on exploring electricity and uh, simulations to calculate star formation rays and gas properties and so on and so forth. Uh, we will have tons and tons of opportunities to network. So please network, network, network at this symposium. Uh, so uh, every day there will be breakfast at 8.30 in the morning, except today. Uh, tomorrow onwards at 8.30, gather at the uh, Mueller Cafe. Uh, so 8.30 to 9 o'clock or so. Then we'll have two coffee breaks every day, about 30 minutes or so. Then we'll have a lunch break as well. And at the end of each day, we have something of the other plan. So today, for example, we will have a welcome reception at 5.30 right here, uh, where you probably have a lunch, uh, I think. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have a baseball game. Uh, not that we're going to play, but then we're going to see Oreos uh, play. So uh, uh, th there was an email sent about this. So in case you missed it and you are still interested in attending this baseball game, please get in touch with our lock member, Alec Hirschauer. There he is in the red shirt. Uh, 
clearly visible from uh, from far away. But like, uh, so uh, in case you want to join this, uh, this is tomorrow evening. Wednesday evening, we'll have a happy hour uh, at STS here in the in the cafeteria itself. So you know, you can have beers, you can have non-alcoholic things if you if you like. But basically, the purpose of all of these events is that to talk to each other in a more informal atmosphere uh, and tons and tons of opportunities to break the ice if there's any ice. Uh, and lastly, on Thursday evening, we'll have the social dinner here itself again uh, in the evening around uh, 6 30 or so. Uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Slack channel. Uh, and so, we have all of these block members. So, if block members can stand up uh, so that you can identify them, you'll have the pictures as well. Uh, I've tried to make sure this is the latest pictures I could find of them. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the conference. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We'll hand it over to uh, first review. Our first like, speaker is Laxley Borgado. All right, I have the distinct pleasure of opening our uh, session today. Uh, we'll be talking about the role of stellar feedback um, for regulating star formation in galaxies. Um, and this will be a theory perspective, so, you know, buckle up. And I wanted to start with putting the entire conference perspective onto one slide. And I can tell you this was not easy to do, right? Because we're really talking about recipes to regulate star formation at all scales, right? All scales, we have to, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'll be going from the IGM to the CGM, starting from megaparsec scales down to hundreds of PPC, what regulates gas flows in galaxies from the IGM to CGM, transitioning uh, today, tomorrow, talking about more local processes in galaxies, um, how gas cools and is converted to a molecular phase, how that molecular gas then condenses to form stars. And then, of course, the goal of this session is to really understand how when stars form, that feedback from stars then back reacts to the gas and regulates the process of star formation. Right? So, of course, supernova naturally uh, come to mind when one thinks about stellar feedback processes, which also can drive outflows and, again, connecting all scales back to the IGM and the CGM. But we have a lot of other stellar feedback mechanisms, which are equally important, especially for regulating star formation at the cloud scales, right? Stellar winds, stellar jets, radiation, um, outflows, all of these things we will hear about in the next session. So that's a very challenging, uh, but, but really a lot of fun um, task to review and set the stage for a lot of our talks for today and for tomorrow. And I was thinking what's important here, perhaps, is to review theories that connect to three different observational motivated findings, right? And so this is, you know, 25 minutes. I'll do my very best to cover all three of these. So this is also the takeaway slide. This is the outline and, and the things I would like you to take away here. So the first thing I'll talk about is the star formation rate and turbulence across cosmic time. Um, the second thing I'll highlight, I'm not going to read the, the points, the conclusion points here, I'll get to that. Um, but here, the second point here is the star formation efficiency, how gas is converted to stars, what regulates that process of the star formation efficiency. And then the third thing I'd like to review and highlight is the evolutionary life cycle of giant molecular clouds, the site of star formation. Um, and I will discuss um, both observational and theoretical work that's being done uh, to uncover what regulates the lifetimes of giant molecular clouds, which is, of course, intimately related to the first two points here about the conversion of gas to stars and also the star formation rate, since all known star formation forms from molecular clouds. The very, very end, I will mention maybe some future outlooks of what we can do if we had a high spectral resolution. Uh, FUV telescope, like Habitable Worlds Observatory, hopefully coming in the next decade. 
soon, or maybe even on a shorter time scale with the next presentation. So that's the plan for the talk. So first, um, star formation rate and turbulence across the So then um, all right, so this is what I'd like to focus on for this first section of the review. Okay, and so we know that galaxies are extremely diverse across redshift. Well, galaxies, right? They're smoother, they're diskier, they tend to have lower star formation rates. If you look at the, the famous Dow plot, um, their star formation rate density is a function of redshift, right? The star formation is lower at present times. They have lower mass accretion, they have lower levels of turbulence, um, and lower gas fraction content overall. If we go to high redshift, although not that high redshift nowadays, right? Redshift two, redshift three, right? Cosmic noon, galaxies look very different. They're clumpier, they have very high star formation rates, they have their gas rich, they also have more turbulence. And so we want to be able to explain and understand what regulates the star formation rate and turbulence in these galaxies. Right? Speaking of turbulence, we can also take our observations of star formation rate and velocity dispersions in galaxies and see how they, they correlate with each other at low star formation rates. So these are more typical, again, of local galaxies. You have something Milky Way-like in terms of the velocity dispersions around 10, 20 kilometers uh, a second velocity dispersions. And one can see that in the ionized uh, gas trace by H alpha, the neutral gas trace by H1, or molecular gas trace by CO. They're generally in agreement, although the H alpha tends to be, the ionized gas tends to be higher. As you go to higher star formation rates, you have this uptick in the velocity dispersion. This is true not only of the ionized gas, but most of these observations, especially going towards the higher redshifts or H alpha, but also true for uh, H1 and the CO traces. Um, this now is a very recent um, numerical simulation work with the New Horizon cosmological simulations that go down to 34 parsec resolution. This is a, a view, very similar sorts of plots, but now looking at a Pinnacus Schmidt like plot where you have the uh, molecular gas surface density here on the x axis and the star formation rate surface density on the y axis. Right, and you see the formation of the Kinnikus Schmidt relation at both redshift 4 and redshift 0.25. Um, but the difference now is the color bar here is the sonic Mach number. Again, another tracer of turbulence. And again, you see higher star formation, higher amounts of gas. You tend to have these higher levels of turbulence. And so, what is conspiring to bring together the velocity dispersions, the star formation rates, et cetera, in, uh, in galaxies both near and uh, and far. Um, and so there's a number of models, and we'll I think, hear about these models throughout this session that I wanted to highlight that seek to provide an explanation for this behavior uh, with a self regulated equilibrium setup. And uh, for example, feedback self regulation star formation models uh, tend uh, to start with the Kinnikus Schmidt like relation. So you have a relationship between the star formation rate surface density and the gas surface density. A characteristic time scale, usually the free fall time scale, and an efficiency factor, which will be the second part of, of this talk. I'm going to get to that. Um, then we can also assume if we have a disk, maybe we have vertical force balance, right? So you have the weight of the ISM that's balanced by the turbulent and thermal supports in the interstellar medium. Maybe also magnetic support is important. So you can write down an equilibrium condition for the vertical balance of the disk. And then you have a, a disk that is maybe stable in terms of modes that are um, expanding or compressing the disk. So you can have a, what's called a tumor stability criterion as well. So this is uh, some general assumptions that go into all of these models. And then we can also assume something about energy balance, right? So if we have injection of turbulence um, and the dissipation of that turbulence, we can write an energy uh, per uh, energy density loss. We can have a injection of turbulence, let's say some feedback. We only consider a feedback regulation. That's an energy gain term uh, that's proportional to the momentum per unit mass of stars uh, in our galaxy. Then we can equate the gain and loss terms, right? So if we do that, then we can have a nice system that star formation uh, you know, injects supernova feedback, 
feedback then injects turbulence, turbulence then means the distance, so on and so forth. This is a great set. Um, the problem, though, is that when we solve that gain and loss um, equation, right, we'll, we can back out a sort of estimated uh, value for the velocity dispersion, right? So it will depend on that momentum injected per unit stellar mass for supernova. And typically those numbers are around 10, maybe 20 or 30 kilometers a second, which can definitely explain the bulk of galaxies, uh, especially low redshift, sort of Milky Way like star formation rates are lower, but it doesn't explain the full diversity. And so we can also appeal to other energy terms in order to see if we can get additional energy um, beyond supernova energy for our feedback regulated picture of star formation and turbulence in galaxies. And if we just plug in some fiducial values, let's say for the Milky Way, just plugging in for the energy per unit area that we get from turbulence, like this would be our dissipation term, so three times 10 to the nine. Okay, if we plug in similarly energy per unit area for supernova and for stellar feedback, we see that these numbers three times 10 to the nine is the solar circle values that I plugged in here. Okay, they agree pretty well, so that's great. Supernova can balance, it can source the turbulent energy that we see in each other. But of course, other energy terms, like let's say mass inflow through the disk, right? So the transfer of mass in our disk galaxy also has a similar number if we take fiducial solar circle. So we can add another gain term to our energy, right? So in, in terms of the sort of flow chart here, you have both uh, source, um, from gravitational instability, mass transfer through the disk for your turbulent velocity, as well as for supernova. Um, and then you can also set up a very similar balance of all of those terms. Um, and now you just have an additional gain term in addition to the supernova that offsets the turbulence in the um, And this line here um, from a, a, a jar and at all 2022 is showing the combination of both those models where you take feedback into account as well as gravitational instability. And with gravitational instability, essentially it provides as much energy as you need to keep Q of one and to regulate vertical flow. Plain, you know, sky's the limit almost for the velocity dispersion here by adding in that gain. So this, I think, was a really nice paper that did a sort of self-controlled test of turning on feedback, turning off feedback um, in uh, disk simulations. They're isolated disks using the Ramsey's numerical simulation. Um, and so this case here is no feedback. They have feedback. Um, of course, when you'd have no supernova feedback, you'd mess up lots of things in the interstellar medium. Uh, you don't get the phase structure right. You don't get the hot gas right. Um, but nevertheless, I think this was a nice experiment to see what happens to the star formation rate velocity dispersion um, when, when you turn feedback on and off, and when you also change the gas fraction. Gas fraction is an important parameter that will set um, how much energy can be sourced to turbulence for gravitational instability. Um, so the red lines here are, are different beams in the simulations, and you can see with or without feedback, it actually doesn't seem to matter too much. You kind of get around a 10 kilometer or 15 kilometer a second or so velocity dispersions. Um, you, so you reach similar values of the velocity dispersion, um, but you change a lot of things in the disk. If you increase the gas fraction, you now can explain a lot of these higher velocity dispersion um, points. You add more energy for the mass transport when you change the velocity dispersion. So this makes a lot of sense in terms of what you see in the simulations. Um, but another thing I'll point out here is that this study also did a great job of looking at other effects that might, uh, observational effects in particular, that might explain some of these very high values of velocity dispersion. Um, for example, beam smearing, especially for the H alpha data, could be part of the culprit of explaining these very extreme velocity dispersions. Uh, in fact, they never found velocity dispersions in their numerical simulations over 50 kilometers. That in mind, we're looking at these very, very high. Okay, moving on. Um, I would like to also talk about and review some recent work on the conversion of gas to stars, uh, which is parameterized by uh, the star formation efficiency. And um, usually, uh, people, especially theorists, like to talk about the star formation efficiency per free fall time. This is also motivated by observations. Um, 
and then uh, several papers by Frumholt and collaborators showing that the star formation efficiency per free fall time tends to be around 1% and kind of remarkably tends to be around 1%, whether you're looking at, you know, Z of two to three galaxies up here, um, or if you're looking at local Milky Way uh, resolved clouds, 1% line I mean, with, with quite a bit of scatter, but still the median there, 1%, I think is quite remarkable um, that this, you know, over pill parsec scale or over local GMC star forming regions, you still have this 1% fall. Um, now, there's a caveat there that in very extreme star formation environments where the surface densities are much higher, you can have potentially high star formation efficiency. I think we'll hear a lot about that um, here. So, the question here is why is only 1% of the gas converted into stars? Um, and there's a lot of literature, really rich history of literature that goes back to use a turbulent regulated model to explain the uh, inefficiency of star formation. Um, and so the way these models work is they start by saying, well, you know, if we want to consider the density field which stars are sourcing, turbulence will produce a long normal distribution in density, also column density. And we know generally what sets that log normal width. It's the strength of the turbulence, which people usually think very much rise as the Mach number. And we know how to do integrals over a log normal. Yay, that's great. So we all we need to do now is just have a good theory for the critical density for collapse. Right. So where do I start my integral over which I will sum my mass in my molecular cloud? And then say, okay, that's the amount of gas available for star formation. And then, okay, there's some efficiency factors and some of this gas is ejected, but basically that's my nice model for the star formation efficiency. And this sort of um, framework has been used also to describe the check relation and the initial mass function, etc. Well, since, since sort of those kind of early 2000s models for turbulent regulated star formation, there's been a lot of work understanding the role of feedback, the essential role of feedback for regulating uh, the amount of gas that ends up going into stars. So here's some work I'm highlighting from Sabrina Apple, where she looked in depth at the density distribution. If you only have turbulence, or if you now have turbulence plus outflow, jet, radiative feedback, and you see the PDF shapes are no longer log normal, especially at low densities, the feedback promotes some very chaotic behavior, um, which then uh, if you were to apply your uh, integral over the PDF, you would have something that's much lower uh, than you would get with just the turbulent regulated picture. There's also been a lot of work by Christoph Satterath and his group uh, showing that as you add progressively more complex physics, so gravity only, gravity turbulence in green, the blue line here now adding magnetic fields, and the black line starting to add stellar feedback in the form of jets, um, the um, Star formation efficiency here on the y axis that got cut off, uh, starts to lower and lower and lower until you get around the 1% level. And so I think now the picture is you cannot only have turbulence. Uh, there also has to be the role of stellar feedback in regulating the gas so that it doesn't collapse um, and uh, eventually have a very high efficiency. There's been fantastic work from the Starforge group uh, led by Mike Gurdich. Um, on this topic. And this is, a, I think, a really insightful plot from uh, one of his papers where he's plot the star formation efficiency for free fall time as a function of time. The black line here has no feedback. So if you let this simulation continue onwards, the star formation efficiency for free fall will climb to 100%. So it's that role of feedback that then, you know, you have an initial burst of star formation, but quickly stars start to regulate the collapse of the cloud and level this. Uh, star formation efficiency off uh, and, and essentially regulate it to something around a percent within the scatter as well. Now you'll notice Mike Kerr did a controlled study where he varied the mass and the radius of the cloud. And that gets actually to an important point, which I think will come up several times at this conference, which feedback at some point fails, right? Why does it fail? Because if you increase the surface density of the cloud, if you want to balance the force of gravity with the, the force uh, forces of feedback, so the momentum, uh, change in momentum per unit stellar mass, you can do this calculation and you'll find that that kind of balances at some critical surface density. 
but you can plug in the usual numbers for the momentum for feedback, you'll get a surface density of around 3,000 solar masses per parsec squared. So Mike and also um, uh, other other work, Shimon Kohler um, and uh, collaborators, have done very nice simulations where they vary the surface density. And as you go towards that kind of reddish lines uh, here where the feedback starts to fail, right, you'll notice that the star formation efficiency climbs above that kind of 1% um, you know, special value of 1%. Right, and the 1% value is definitely, I think, observationally and theoretically sound in terms of uh, typical, you know, Milky Way life or even um, uh, reasonable surface densities that are below, you know, 1,000, more like 10 to 100 solar masses per parsec. But once you get into this range here, it seems that feedback can no longer support runaway collapse and you have a much higher efficiency, which could be uh, very relevant for high redshift density. Uh, how, how okay, so the third thing I would like to highlight is the evolution of GMCs, right? So this life cycle of molecular cells. Um, and this is, I think, a very important topic because there's not as much observation. But so far, I've been showing you simulations, I've been showing you observations. Here, we are really um, kind of groping for, for basic. Uh, observational probes of how this gas life cycle proceeds in galaxies, and it's really critical because this was highlighted as one of the decadal uh, priorities in the 2020 uh, Astro uh, Decadal Survey, right? So gas, how it goes from collapsing, dense forming stars, and there's a period where there's a cloud and stars coexisting, right? The feedback is really is critical for breaking the cloud up and stopping uh, the formation of the next generation of stars, and at some point the clouds do form. So, what is this life cycle of gas overlap with stars, and then stars dispersing the gas, and the gas cloud forming somewhere else? Okay, so this overlap period is usually characterized with the the emission of H alpha. Right? So, if you see a uh, coexistence of CO and molecular tracers with H alpha, you know that you're in this dispersal period where the cloud is just starting to disperse. Um, and there was a wonderful review from Melanie Chavant um, uh, from a few years ago where they were checking uh, molecular clouds, the dispersal time of clouds. Again, this is very uncertain because it's really the time scale at which you start to see H2 regions forming in the cloud and also the free fall time here. Which is just based on the density. So, what this is telling you is that local GMCs, they live for several free fall times, right, before they disperse, right? So, are they, are they really short? Like, is this the first massive stars start forming, right? So, you've got around five mega years or so for the lifetime of a massive star, and then is the GMC over? So, I think this question is really limited by how do you probe lifetime to well, we can of course do this in simulation. No problem. Uh, it's hard for the observation, but easy for the simulation. And there was fantastic work uh, recently by Sarah Jefferson using a repo numerical simulations of isolated uh, disk galaxies and um, uh, dwarf galaxies uh, to look at if the lifetime of the molecular cloud was really set by the chemical lifetime of H2. Um, or it's really set maybe more by a uh, larger scale process. She had a range of clouds, it's this galaxy simulation. She had smaller clouds, larger scale clouds, the whole mass spectrum of GMCs. Um, and she can use tracer particles to actually trace out the H2 and also see if it's going out or going in. Um, and what she found was that uh, the large clouds, so the, the, the here, the, the color here is the lifetime of clouds. So these are yellow being the longest lived clouds. Um, the lifetimes here are very much dependent on mass. Bigger clouds tend to live longer than smaller ones. Um, she also found that there's equal, roughly equal amounts of mass coming in to a cloud, a large cloud, and there is exiting the cloud. So she's actually able to track the H2 coming in and coming out of the cloud. So this is really the age of the molecular cloud is very much linked to how big the cloud is. And her explanation is, well, H2, actually the lifetime of individual molecules is still quite short, the chemical lifetime, but that lifetime of the actual cloud is much longer than that chemical lifetime. 
This is because accretion is coming into the cloud. So there's local patches of star formation, and H2 region is born. It starts to kill off the molecular H2 locally, but then because the cloud is large, it starts to accrete from the environment and then additional generations of stars. Now, how can we observe this? Right? It's very difficult again because you know most of the tracers of cloud lifetimes, you're connecting H alpha and CO together. Um, that doesn't give you a direct lifetime. Um, and so I think there is a way to do this. Like, so this is saying, can we observe H2 formation and destruction directly? I think we can if we can observe the H2 directly. How do we do this? Right. So H2, of course, has no permanent dipole moment, so it doesn't efficient, um, efficiently radiate. Um, but we do have quadrupolar um, IR emission and also electronic excited states. So uh, if they're pumped up, um, they can also radiate in the X. So JWST, of course, can directly observe H2. It observes that uh, infrared quadrupolar um, emission, but this is quite weak. And it's not really clear if you're directly seeing you know, shocks, warm H2. So it's most likely you're seeing shocks, but it also could be uh, you're seeing the emission from the UV pumped cascade that's heading down from the X. So it's not really exactly always clear what the excitation mechanism in the infrared is. Um, so if we had an FUV telescope and we need high spectral resolution to really resolve all of the H2 fluorescent lines, there's 5,000 5, of them or more. Um, so if you had a, a very uh, high resolution, so at least 10 part of 10,000 sort of FUV telescope, you would then be able to resolve this emission line spectrum. And the dissociation rate of H2 is directly proportional to the total intensity of that uh, FUV uh, H2 spectrum. So you would directly see the dissociation of H2 with these kinds of observations. Um, you can also estimate the formation rate of the H2. And that's because when H2 forms on dust grains, it's uh, the orthopara ratio of the H2 that's set. Um, and so it's set to three. Um, this is just from the H2 chemistry. And then as the H2 goes about its life, that where the para ratio can then decay. It depends on temperature. It depends on, let's say, the positive reionization rate. Um, but if you, if you have estimates for those things, then you can take that work of para ratio that you observe in your spectrum and then directly link that to a chemical test. So we would be able to make these kinds of observations if we had such a high resolution uh, FUV spectrogram. And hopefully, one is coming. The Habitable Worlds Observatory. Um, you know, the, the specs are not, I think, set at this point, but I think the science pieces that the community you guys here are coming up with will drive part of the, the uh, specifications of the telescope in terms of the spectral resolution and so forth. Uh, but I think at least R of 10,000, you'll be able to resolve these lines um, in the FUV. And there are also optical and infrared capabilities that you can link together the full H2 spectrum from the FUV all the way to the infrared in one observation. It would be absolutely amazing. Um, you know, this is, I don't know, 20 years off, if we're lucky, hopefully less. Hopefully less. Uh, so I think we could do at least a passenger version of this beforehand with like a SMEX like mission. And hopefully the AO for the next SMEX poll will be coming out um, in the next couple of months. Um, and so there's a, a telescope proposal called EOS, which will do exactly the science I was just talking about. And the idea here is to measure the formation rate, the orthopara ratios, the dissociation rate directly from the total intensity of the FUV. And then one would then be able to do targeted observations of local DMPs to see if the cloud is growing, if the cloud is in kind of a chemical equilibrium. Or if the cloud is dissociated, right? And also linking that to the picture of H alpha and H2 regions forming, I think will be really interesting. Okay, with that, here's my conclusion. And I'll go through it here in that one minute. So, you know, the very first part of the talk, I covered the star formation rate as redshift and the link with turbulence. Here's some processes that model that modify the overall gas dynamics of the galaxy, so gas accretion, gravitational instability, and supernova feedback regulate formation on those large scales. 
If you go to smaller and smaller scales, right, the conversion of gas to stars on an individual KPT region or GMT scales uh, is regulated also by the interplay of turbulence and feedback. And it's typically a few percent, unless you have a very high surface density in which feedback may, may fail to be terrific. Um, and then finally, I think this is sort of a frontier area of the evolutionary cycle of GMT. I think the chemical lifetime of H2 is short, around four mega years, and that's because of the formation of large H2 regions that disrupt uh, the molecule. But the clouds themselves can actually be long lived still uh, because they live in the galactic environment, they're able to excrete uh, efficiently into the long term. And I think in the near future, to having the world's future, we'll be able to actually make direct measurements of H2 formation and destruction and testing. Thank you. Fantastic talk. I'm biased, of course, because so many things are these things are close to my heart. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, from the audience. Turning the mic. I think, yeah, the UVEX, I think, I think the R of a thousand isn't going to be enough to resolve the brightest 10 lines that you would need to estimate the total UV intensity um, to do this particular science. Um, UVEX will do lots of amazing things, super exciting mission, but I just don't think it will have the spectral resolution. To do to do exactly this, we really need something more cost-like, but with a much larger field of view than possible. Surveyable. Maybe multiplexing. Yeah. Other questions? Are there any online? Interested in the things that are showing both the same two and the last one gas at the same time. I'm curious what the physical picture is. Of stars being ionized while the molecular gas is still around the regions of the low gas systems, or is it something else going on? Yeah, so I mean, we have the, the first massive star forming in the new region of the steering. And for smaller clouds, to the fourth ish solar mass, that could be the end of that cloud. But if you have a much larger cloud, you could have pockets where the cloud is dissociating, right? It's ionized, and then you still have mass accretion coming in, formation uh, from the atomic phase, the molecular phase, formation of CO. Um, so both can coexist simultaneously. And that's sort of the period where people would estimate the dispersal time of the cloud. But I think Sarah's work is really informative because it's showing that if the cloud is large enough, it can sort of continuously accrete gas, form new H2, uh, which can then go on and form the next generation of stars, even when the cloud is getting dispersed over here. So the idea of a discrete cloud, you know, is maybe a great idea when it coexists with other gas. And in terms of the H2 or the FUV, this would really be observing the boundary layer. Much warmer layer of molecular gas, which is surrounding the polar field. Okay, so it'd be a new way to trace the warmth. I think I saw another hand raised from that. Why don't we go here first? Okay. So, this particular interest is by um, 
That's a great question. Yeah, so this is the star formation efficiency for three fold time. And so, on a very short time scale, the cloud can, can very rapidly collapse. And just stars are forming, but that immediate feedback does not have enough momentum to produce the efficiency of the cloud. The supernova come later. So, you know, by, by the time the supernova are happening, the uh, star formation efficiency will already be quite large, larger than the kind of sort of Milky Way 10 to 100 solar mass per parsec that we're used to seeing. Um, but these really extreme surface density regions, the, cloud, the immediate feedback processes just aren't, they don't have enough momentum to stop the cloud or before the first stage. Okay, I think we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Let's give a hand to Lindsay. Hey, continuing on uh, in the session, we have radiated feedback and dense compact starburst. Uh, Cheyenne from Rutgers with Everest. Great. Um, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Shyam, and I'm a postdoc joined between uh, Rutgers and the CCA at the Flat Island Institute. I'm going to be providing some insights from numerical simulations on the conditions of star formation and feedback in dense compact starbursts, which I will argue is relevant to the context of high redshift galaxies that JWST is now holding. So to put things in context, thankfully I don't have to do too much here, but make it a brilliant film, um, is that star formation, as we all know, is inherently multi-scale and inherently very complex uh, with star formation occurring in galaxies, especially in the dense cold phase of the ISF of galaxies. Uh, these are typically the so-called giant molecular clouds. Uh, and this, these clouds of stars form from the gas, but also once stars form, they provide feedback on the environment. And so this regulation of star formation by feedback this occurs at the scale of these clouds. And so understanding or quantifying the aspects of that is really important for a broader understanding of star formation galaxies. And because of this motivation, there has been a lot of work in the past few years, and a general picture has emerged um, for how star formation feedback interact with each other in these tests cold phases of the ISF of galaxies. And then broadly uh, summarized in the schematic by Matthew Orr, where you have gas which forms a cold dense space, and then you have star formation. And specifically, once you have massive stars forming in these so-called clusters, they provide feedback on the environment, which, which break up the clouds. Then uh, in such a way that only a small fraction of that cloud mass ends up in the stars, that's typically less than about 20% of the mass. And the rest of the mass can then be recycled elsewhere in the ISF of galaxies. Now, this work has been done in a broad range of studies, and the, the physics, the, the feedback physics that seems to be responsible for, for regulating at these scales is the so called early stellar feedback mechanisms, that is, the radiative feedback mechanisms, stellar winds, which occur before supernova. Um, and this is, this is going to be relevant. And, but the, the fact is that most of the, most of the studies in the, in, the, in the recent past have been focused on conditions typical of the local universe. So these are ISF pressures about 10 to the 4. Kelvin per centimeter. So an interesting question to ask is what, what happens when you go to more dense compact environments? Uh, the ISM pressure is just a few orders of magnitude higher in local universal conditions. Now these in the local universe granted are relatively rare. So you see this in galaxies such as the, the antenna galaxy, where you have the merger providing such dense ISM conditions. We can form giant molecular clouds such as so-called firecracker molecular clouds. This gas surface density is about a 10 to the 4 solar mass particle. So, to put this in context, this is this number is about a factor of hundreds of thousands smaller in a uh, in the Milky Way. Now, although this is extreme for the local universe, this may not be the case in the high redshift universe, as you, as you can imagine, 
and this has been shown and quantified um, in, in the JWST by Angela Helmut, where you can actually resolve individual star clusters in relative to any galaxy, which I think is amazing. Uh, and the, what, what they are finding is that in star clusters of these high redshift galaxies, the stellar surface densities of the star clusters are systematically higher than what you see in local universe galaxies. So these points here are the stellar surface densities of local uh, star clusters. Whereas the high redshift galaxy in the star clusters in high redshift galaxies, they are higher by about a factor of 100 per thousand. So what this is telling you is that conditions of star formation in these high redshift galaxies are systematically denser and more compact. So understanding how star formation proceeds and how feedback interface with star formation in such conditions is crucial. And so motivated by this, we run a set of simulations uh, aimed at trying to understand the systematic difference between how does local universe star formation proceed differently for the high redshift. And so we ran uh, idealized simulations of uh, clouds with surface densities typical of uh, local universe the conditions out in extreme conditions. So to, to conduct a systematic exploration, um, and we model the feedback uh, in different bands that are relevant for, for this competition between star formation and feedback. And we don't have a resolution to resolve individual stars, so we assume an IMF for our simulations. And this is run with a flash MHD code with a, with a uh, slightly better uh, numerical method to motivate the feedback. So I played the movie of the circle. So the top left panel is the lower surface density case, which is typical Milky Way like condition, and the top bottom right is the most high, most extreme surface density. And you can see uh, from the top left to the bottom right the variation, uh, the different triangles for how the cloud evolves. You can clearly see that the different panels evolve very differently. Uh, the top quantifies a bit more than next slides. So so how are things different between the top left panel and the bottom right panel? So one of the one of the things that's which Blakey talked about also, and you can see clearly in the movies, is that as you go to more dense compact conditions, the star formation efficiency increases this, uh, drastically. So for Milky Way like clouds, you have star formation efficiency of about 10%. So about 10% of the gas mass is converted to stars by the time the feedback is struck the cloud. However, when you go to more extreme conditions, you, you convert almost 100 percent of the gas to stars. And so the feedbacks are able to regulate the star formation efficiencies and conditions. Now, one of the questions that's interesting to ask is these, these, these precise conditions of high surface density and low metallicity to expect in these high galaxies are precisely the, the best case scenario for where you can have possibly a top area that has been suggested in several studies. So the reason this is relevant in this in this context is when you have a top area event, you have more massive stars. And so you have more UV luminosity for your mass. So the, the competition between star formation and feedback can skew more in, in, in favor of feedback. So to, to test this question, we ran some simulations where we, we, we alluded to different IMF or top heavy IMF. And the, the sort of conclusion that came out is the top star formation efficiency of y-axis and increasingly top heavy IMFs in the x-axis. And indeed, when you when you increase and you become more top heavy, your star formation efficiency drastically falls down. But then, if you go to the metallicities represented in the, the, the galaxy we see with GWST, uh, the lower metallicity is part of the effects of top heavy IMF. And the reason this is the case is that the, 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 the most important feedback credits physics that set the star formation efficiency here is the radiation pressure on dust grains. And if you have low metallicities, uh, if you assume a linear correlation between the two, uh, you have low metallicities. Uh, so, what does this mean? Feedback does nothing? No. Uh, what it does to, in, 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 even if it doesn't uh, regulate star formation efficiency, is that it drives outflows of whatever gases is present in the cloud once a high star formation efficiency is achieved. Uh, and these outflows uh, can have velocities of order of 30 to 100 per second. And it's a combination of the ionized and neutral basins. And again, it's the radiation pressure on dust that drives these outflows. Um, and um, the it's, it's interesting that in the local universe, you can see so these so-called super star cluster forming environments, you see evidence of such outflows uh, playing out uh, in the galaxies in the ABC 3 Now, the reason this is all relevant, apart from observational consequences, is that these outflows, once once the star formation, once star formation is occurred and the feedback that are outflows, you then carve pathways for the lightning continuum photons from these from these uh, star clusters to escape. Uh, from the star cluster or, or, uh, subsequently from the galaxy. And so, and the reason this all plays out and how this all plays out for quantitatively is that so if you look at the cumulative alignment continuously from the star cluster as a function of time, 
There's three factors that set this value, and the three factors are stellar mass, how much escape, how much of these the photon and the star cluster escape, and you know at what time is that. And the reason the time is important is that so if you look at the UV luminosity of stellar population, it's flat for the first four million years, and then it drastically drops because massive stars come to that. So to have a good high escape fraction or a high UV, uh, a high number of UV photons escaping from the star cluster, you want to have a high escape fraction at early times. And this is precisely the conditions that are the outcome that comes out for the very high gas levels being escape. So what I'm showing here is the cumulative alignment that's being escape as a function of time for our different clouds. As you can see, for the highest level density cloud, we have about a factor of 10 high, more, more you would have alignment than you put on over the lifetime of the slug population. And this is because of three, three factors. One is that you have more, you have more emission star formation, so you have more stellar mass. But you also have higher escape fractions at earlier times. And so as the star clusters are young, you're allowing your alignment of the photons to escape. And so this is sort of brought the, the, uh, the, the three ways in which the uh, star formation. So the three the different ways in which the uh, conditions of star formation and feedback are different with high dense compact conditions. Firstly, is that you have high star formation efficiency. And this, as I, as I just mentioned, we yield bound, you know, bound efficient star wars and leaky clouds to be the bound clusters, which is probably the precursors of globular clusters in the universe. And what we find is even the top area is that this is the case. And this is, I know, uh, as, I said, as I said earlier, this is possibly has implications on massive galaxies in redshift and as we probably hear from later talks. Um, we, we also find uh, evidence of outflows in our simulations. And this could have impacts on evacuating dust in the gas in the surroundings of these stars. Um, and as I mentioned, this, the, this, these, these sort of conditions are can be disproportionate sources of alignment and human leakage to these sort of superstar cluster environments. And we need to capture the radiation pressure on dust to capture this spill. And so, uh, the, my pitch would be that so we call so the star clusters we call extreme in the local universe are not extreme. So, let's just call the star clusters at the high redshift universe. So, understanding them better, so understanding local extreme analogs are important. And we need more numerical work understanding aspects of star formation feedback in these conditions. Thank you. Questions? Oh, um, we're having problems uh, with the people online hearing the question. So if you can repeat the question, that yeah. would help a lot. Will you, will you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you just mentioned that we said some extreme. Local analogs of examples. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess what, what, what you would call superstar clusters uh, in the local universe, you have some in uh, MA2, uh, some in the antenna, um, and galaxies like MBC 253. Uh, these are the names I can, can think of. But, yeah. Brad? Sorry, the question was for those online. Uh, what are the what are some examples of um, extreme conditions? So I'm just going to mention another protocol. Local analog, which is on MC3065, so it's a bar galaxy, so it funnels all the gas down the bar in the center. So we found there are more 10 to 6 or higher um, solar mass uh, clusters uh, in 3065 and in the antenna. Comment from Brad that there are um, NDC 1365 that are in the sun. If I read your uh, last figure correctly, seems like so your uh, basically your Mars. Uh, density of the DNC, separate or the cloud. Sorry, could you repeat that? So, if, if I read your last figure correctly, uh, yeah, this one. So, the cloud coding here is uh, basically the perfect density of the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to make some operational predictions? Like, if we, we 
just up there a certain uh, certain time uh, because the dance is going to be full. So do you like have a can, can I read it like if there's a correlation between the escape and the density or? Right. The question was um, so in this this plot that I'm showing you is the gas surface density indication of cloud, which would evolve um, stellar surface density that would, would subsequently become the difference. So can you correlate that instead with uh, the SK fraction? Um, so that's not what I've, I've not done it, right? But um, my guess would be the two correlate, the stellar surface density would correlate with the initial gas surface density. So the correlation between so, yeah, the surface density and the escape fraction should still hold. So, uh, if you have questions, then you have access to the Slack. Please continue the conversation on there. And let's get to have a round of applause again. Welcome back. Thank you guys for your secret. Thank you very much, Janice. Thank you to the organizers for putting on this meeting, which looks like it's going to be absolutely wonderful. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to thank some collaborators, and in particular, I'd like to give a huge shout out to Erin Young, who is now the DS Public Fellow here at Space Telescope. And really, I don't know how I could function without him, honestly. I, he's absolutely uh, essential. So unless you've been living in a cave for the last two years, you've probably heard that JWST has discovered some early galaxies. <laughs> yeah, so there's been a lot of excitement and with good reason because JWST surprised us a little bit. Um, so we now have robust samples of tens of galaxies, many with spectroscopic confirmations, at redshifts of above 10, up to 14, 15, you know, depending on what you believe. Um, so this is showing books. It's showing counts of galaxies as a function of redshift as measured by the Sears survey in the shaded region. And this is showing the luminosity function from Sears and NGD at redshift 11. And so why would we be so surprised? Well, all of these theoretical models that were published before JWST launched did not predict so many luminous galaxies. Okay? And you can see that in addition to that, if you look at the redshift dependence predicted by most of the models, it's a lot steeper. So galaxies decline with redshift much more steeply in the models than what we seem to be seeing. And this, this shortfall in the model seems to be more pronounced on the right end. Okay? So there are the particular difficulties is in producing enough bright galaxies at these very high redshifts. So I can almost skip the next two slides because it's a wonderful talk by Blakesley and Shannon. But just to reiterate, um, I sort of think about star spectrum efficiency as being regulated on these two scales, right? So there's small scales of giant molecular clouds. We heard all about the processes that regulate the star spectrum efficiency and set it to this phenomenal value of a few percent in the local universe. And then as well, we have these galactic scale winds that actually remove the ISM from galaxies, reduce the gas supply in the ISM, and perhaps also the CGM and um, reduce the future gas supply. And what we just heard is that um, this efficiency on cloud scales is much higher in dense clouds. Right? So this is predicted by simulation, this is seen in um, the universe in these dense environments. And in addition, denser clouds also survive longer before they get dispersed. So um, clouds that we know alone in the Milky Way might only survive a few freefall times, but denser clouds can survive more like up to 10 freefall times. So if you put this together with the fact that densities in the early universe were much higher, then we get some interesting conclusions. So let me try to convince you that, that is the case. So from redshift zero to about seven, we know from abundance matching studies and measured galaxy sizes that the size of the star forming region in the galaxy is about two to three percent the virial radius, radius of the halo. Now, yes, that's weird. We can have a conversation later about why that is, but that seems to be the case. And there's even evidence that that holds all the way up to redshift. 9 to 13, 
I can show you if you're interested later. I'll do that in this talk. So if we just assume that the galaxy size scale with the burial radius of Helos, then this is how the Swiss density depends on redshift, assuming that the gas fraction is also the fixed fraction of the variance in the halo. So this declines by about two orders of magnitude from redshift 10 to today. And this is supported directly by observations um, where, where I've used here this measured size discrepancy in the recent table we just sample to push this up to redshift 10. So how do we put these two things together and make global statistical predictions for the implications for high redshift galaxies? Well, I'm going to use something called the semi-analytic model, which most people are probably familiar with. And all of all of these models do is to track these flows on all the different scales that place they outlined at the beginning of the talk. So the flow of gas from the intergalactic medium into halos, down into the ISM of galaxies, and then we have a recipe for gas in the ISM can turn into stars on what time scale. And then we have a recipe for how supernovae flow the ISM out and eject it from the galaxies. And all of these recipes are very simple. We just put them together into a system of ordinary differential equations and solve them on the computer within cosmological merger trees. So traditionally, most people use something like a Kennecott-Schmidt law for this star formation time scale, right? Which is sort of traditional efficiency of a few percent of the free fall time. But that means that it's times. And traditionally, we use a parameterization of the mass loading, the amount of mass that is ejected from galaxies, um, that's some function of the circular velocity of the galaxy as the star formation. Okay, so let's try an experiment now where we leave the star formation efficiency the same, we leave this at Kennecott-Schmidt, and we just turn off the winds, right? We turn off this galactic scale um, feedback mechanism. So the sort of canonical model is shown by these solid yellow lines, and then this model variant is shown by the dotted line. So we get a lot more galaxies. This is showing, by the way, the UV luminosity function at these redshifts, as marked here. And I've done sort of a cheap trick here. I'm assuming a simple conversion from star formation rate to UV luminosity using the formula from Madame Dickinson, and no dust, okay? no dust at the very end of the time. So you can see that turning off the winds does give you more galaxies, but it also gives you a very steep luminosity function. And that's actually been seen in some of the numerical simulations that predicted higher numbers of galaxies, making preferentially more faint galaxies. And that makes sense because it's easier to blow the gas out of these shallow regions. So the new result that I'm very excited to present to you today is implementing a cloud-based model for star formation efficiency into our Santa Cruz semi-analytic models. So I don't expect to absorb all of the equations, but the basic idea is that we take this cloud scale star formation efficiency as a function of surface density um, from this idea that Blakesley presented that the amount of mass that turns into stars compared to the amount of gas that gets ejected from the cloud is set by this momentum injection rate, right, from whatever sources, divided by the gravitational potential rate. Yeah, and all the R squared. Okay. So then you get this relationship between sigma and sigma crit, where sigma crit, like you also have this equation, is just p dot over m star over g. Then I use the wind driven bubble model from Lancaster L2021 to give you my cloud lifetime, which again scales with the cloud surface density. And then what up? I have a star formation rate that I can stick into our models. So the results are shown by these pink lines. Now, one thing that we don't know is what fraction of the gas in the galaxy is in the form of these dense clouds. So I just put a simple factor F dense that we can change. So if F dense was one, you get the solid lines, you actually get lots more galaxies than we're seeing with JWST with F dense of 0.2, which is probably similar to what it is in lower edge galaxies. Um, you're getting these dot dash lines. And if we switch off the winds as well, then you get these, these dotted lines. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, well, this is all well and good, Rachel, but do you get the sizes right? Because of course, this is the fundamental thing that goes into this model, right? The surface density of the galaxy. So this is showing UV luminosity versus size, where the 
red points and the blue line are showing the sizes in this model, but I've shown you um, based on this assumption that galaxy sizes scale with the halo radius, and you can see they're in fairly good agreement with the observations that we run and have from Richard Money for Weapon. So the important thing to take away is that this cloud scale efficiency model gives you a preferential boost on the bright end, so it's producing more bright galaxies, which is what we need. And it also gives you a shallower redshift dependence. So I apologize for this busy plot. This is showing you the counts of galaxies above apparent magnitudes of 29, similar to Sears, or 30.6, more similar to NGT or J's, or an even fainter magnitude that we may be able to someday probe in the future at JWST. And you can see that this model predicts that we should find a few up to maybe 10 galaxies at redshift as high as 18 if this is the model weighted cost of the model. I think that's very exciting. Now you might be wondering, well, what about dust, right? I've been completely ignoring dust and pretending that there isn't any in these galaxies, but that is of course not physical. So if we just um, add up the amount of dust that should be produced by all of these supernovae that have gone off to produce stars and use typical dust yields, then we should have dust masses of around a million solar masses in these galaxies, leading to UV attenuations of several magnitudes, right? So many of those nice UV luminosity functions that I showed you, you know, would go way, way, way down if we have much dust in these galaxies. However, many of you know, we can measure the UV slope, beta UV, in these galaxies, right? And they are extremely blue. They are almost uniformly very blue. There is very little room for dust in the galaxies that we have observed. So either the dust is somehow ejected or pushed out to the point where it's not dependent on the much, or, and I think this is an intriguing possibility, maybe there actually are galaxies out there um, that we're not observing, which have been obscured by dust, and then maybe we'll find them if we can push them. Right? So this is, again, a very definitive prediction that we can test with future observations with JWST. So let me summarize now, just about, just about good on time, um, that I think it's pretty much inevitable that the surface density of the ISM in these very high redshift galaxies was typically at these levels of thousands to 10 to the four solar masses per square parsec, where we expect to have these much larger star formation efficiencies, as shown by nearby simulations and observations. And if we put that together with um, a global model, we actually are now having the opposite problem. We're predicting too many galaxies. We're predicting more galaxies than JWST is seeing. But that's kind of a good problem to have, right? Um, so something that I think is very intriguing to think about, a couple of things that maybe we can talk about during the week. One is, what if the IMF is top heavy? That would make the galaxies even brighter. And Sham has argued that it might not even make feedback that much stronger. What are the implications for feeding supermassive black hole, which have also been found in abundance? So if the star formation is more efficient, does that make black hole growth more efficient or less efficient? Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we have puzzle with dust, which hopefully we'll learn more about the future. Question for I think that's an interesting thing because they probably are seeing these stars when they're kind of young, but then the, the dust yields from supernovae would have to be much lower than what we see nearby. And keep in mind, by region seven, we do see these very dusty galaxies. Right. So it seems like you'd have to make a pretty quick 
shade in the dust field of supernovae. And if you have any ideas for how you do that, let me know. But it seems a little tricky to me to thread that needle. It's rather certain that even with like the very lowest yields that are considered in the literature, that you're getting the largest. Right, and the last comment was about the uncertainty in the yields of the supernova production. I mean, I saw some hands over here in the side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll break down your last point because the things that we have observed spectroscopically, the brightest ones have all seemed to be either AGN or like the GNB level in glass, especially right. 30 so or something. So these are models kind of like agnostic on the type of stars these galaxies should have, like AGN or like other sort of things that can because we've seen even the pollen transitions and stuff, right? In the redshift to our sources, which points towards like something different. Yes, so as I mentioned, we don't know what fraction of the gas then is available to the So in these models, black hole formation is completely switched off. They're not seeing anything about it, but that's actually a thing that we're very interested in and, and working on that. We need to understand the small scale physical condition. Uh, so the question is, is there a reason to bring down we need to make a shallower slope? And that seems to be what we're observing, right? Are your models now over predicting? Now they're over predicting, but they have the right slope. So I think that depends on this question of dust. That's leaving some room for dust. But... Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Thank you, Rachel. So when we selected the abstract, it was done anonymously. So it would be four New Jersey talks in a row with a complete coincidence. Next, Chung Kim Princeton. Hi, uh, sorry, uh, another New Jersey. Here, I'm Chung Kim. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, actually the uh, lesser people, the lepid scale submission rates. And the cloud scale submission rate is more like a uh, larger than the scale hypothesis, scale larger than scale hypothesis. And based on the, our theory for special uh, regulated feedback modulated submission theory and the numerical simulation for types in here. So let me begin uh, by setting the stage with very uh, qualitative arguments first. So to develop an understanding of sub, uh, submission rates, we need to consider, we must consider the balance between the pressure and the gravity. And the, here, the pressure is not only the thermal pressure, but also the turbulent pressure. So the balance between the pressure and the gravity can be uh, wrote pretty easily in the ISM because the ISM is very good at balancing out their stresses. Um, main evidence is that this beautiful image of the ISM that we observe as this is an outcome of the efficient way. So the, once you lose this uh, uh, pressure support, gravity wins, the stars form. And the, the one well-known problem uh, or issue in this one-way story is that the observed star formation wave is much, much lower than the, this for perhaps uh, weight or the pressure of this start with the weight. And uh, this implies that, that there must be a very efficient uh, stress providers in the establishment of the linear. That is, the massive stars, the massive stars can provide the stresses very efficiently to the kind of condition. So, more formally, if I say, uh, uh, in the system, uh, if I think about the system with very efficient gain and loss processes, this is simple relation should hold. So basically, the first the feedback modulate the star formation rate. Uh, feedback module, uh, the, the feedback modulate the pressure, uh, the total pressure in the middle plane that 
uh, is regulated by the weight of the interstellar medium, which is set by the density time of the interval of the density time gravity. So here, this uh, with this relation, we can basically predict the star formation rate substance before given galactic demand or the condition uh, that set the uh, uh, ISM weight by just connecting these two. And then there is a, this in this connection, the key parameter here is the speed of the heat, the ratio between the, the pressure and the star formation. Although I write this in very, very simple way, simple form. The way this feedback is, is determined is very complex in the, the realized sense. This is basically the thing that characterizes the how efficient the feedback is in recovery uh, of the different pressure terms in given uh, SN evolution. So the, because of this coupling of the stellar feedback in the multi-phase turbulent medium size ISM is very complex. Our best bet is uh, using some numerical simulations that actually include such uh, key physical processes more explicitly and also observable processes. So this is uh, one of the main motivations that uh, I've been developing uh, this numerical framework that can solve the MHD equations with the self-gravity, including the supernova feedback, the radiation transfer, and the uh, upper chemistry. So it's not just me and there is a team of the people we work together, especially the John Gil team and the Yunnan Bong, who put a lot of effort in developing the radiation transfer and chemistry molecules. So once we have this, uh, and then we can solve this uh, with the proprietary scale package of the galactic bit, then we can evolve the horizontal ISM uh, self consistently to get the, uh, what is the relation between pressure and the star function. So I can show you an uh, example of movies here. So the, now what you are seeing is the gas surface density map in terms along the uh, uh, one vertical direction. Uh, on top of there, there are some star particles formed in the simulation presented in the different colors. And the, the evolution basically, this evolution basically shows the uh, formation and construction of the dense cluster and also the uh, formation of stars in this dense structure and disruption of these uh, clusters uh, by uh, people. And if I just uh, focusing on this particular snapshot and showing going through the what we have in the simulation, we have all these different uh, chemical species of the uh, hydrogen, so the, the, the atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen and the ions. So, and going back and forth give you an impression that the first this gray uh, low density region is filled with ionized gas and then this uh, GMC uh, the molecular clouds are very concentrated in the uh, more uh, dense regions and the atomic gas fills up a lot of the volume and also occupies a lot of gas. Especially this is true for the polar negative condition that is more air here. Yeah. And just give you the idea of how they are distributed uh, in this uh, uh, show this in the RG. So, and then the, but to really understand the, the details, we need to look at some details of that of the SM. So here, the number density slices at the middle plane. Then this, uh, the bottom left, is the bio B radiation field that is more efficient dimension. So each bright spots are the sources, meaning that there are there are star cluster there, and then they basically uh, propagate and absorb by the dust and that absorption to the dust really provide the heating to the ISM. There are nice shadow tested uh, behind the dense structure. Yeah. But it, overall, the five radiation field is pretty smooth. In contrast, the EUV, uh, extreme UV radiation field, have a pretty uh, severe truncation because whenever they meet the uh, neutral uh, hydrogen, it is absorbed by, uh, to ionize that gas. Okay, so the, I hope that I convinced that our simulation is pretty nice and that it is useful to really understand the holistic evolution of the uh, star forming interstellar medium and their connection with star formation wave. So now I can use, I can learn the pseudo simulation and then uh, see how their uh, connection actually changes 
depending on the uh, conditions and also the ecological conditions. The main focus in this talk is about the metallurgy. So the other things that have been presented in the previous work. So first, I'm today showing you the uh, metallistic dependence in the solar neighborhood model. So I keep the same relative condition, but just change the gas metallicity and also cost of together. Moving from the solar three times solar to the point one solar, we see the uh, difference in the star formation. This is true for the higher subsidy and higher uh, pressure, even that is kind of the typical of this analysis. The lower metallicity base pair into the star motion. But this is not actually the causal statement. Uh, actually, what the causality, the main causality we found is from the visualization feedback of this case. Basically, the lowering metallicity, or actually the, uh, going from the right to the left, you see the different uh, radiation field. So we take a selective snapshots uh, to give the similar uh, injective UV radiation field, but that is actually uh, for the, the lower, uh, higher UV field in the sense from the, the reduced UV shading. So that actually basically increases population heating per given injective UV. So that, in terms of the, our uh, PRFM theory, that's basically meaning uh, that's meaning that means the larger thermal feedback is in the lower capacity. So the, what is shown here is for uh, simulations with 28 models covering different relative conditions and also the capacity covers going from the blue to the uh, red, decreasing the capacity you see the increase of the thermal feedback. Here. This is pretty different from the turbulent feedback here, where which are very sensitive to the uh, conditions. Because the supernova feedback momentum injection is very uh, weakly depend on the gas density and the uh, uh, density. So, if we put it together, the total feedback is that we have also have a similar dependence, but it's slightly uh, in, uh, less sensitive than the thermal feedback is for contribution of problems. But with this, what we can expect is we expect the overall higher star formation weight at the multiple. Rate increases, but also the higher um, stop function rate at the uh, given condition with a higher metallicity because of the, the less efficient uh, thermal Okay, so that's the, uh, basically the, what I want to present, and then I'm going to just kind of summarize it as a recipe for the sound with the that can be used for. First, we need the fresh ingredients, which we need to insert to providers. Uh, but just keep in mind the quality ingredients that is the food. So we need a very good observation to actually do this job. And so one of the best providers in the market is the hands team. So you can go to the hands table actually to get all this nice information. Also, you can use the your food simulation where you don't actually go by hand scale. To uh, use their uh, properties to predict the star formation wave. Okay. And uh, for the actual recipe, I need to rearrange the equation to give you the more familiar one. And there are basically the efficiency and the time scale, but the time scale now is not a triple time, it is relative scale, but it's a dynamical time. And you can use some simpler formula or complex formula to estimate that. And then the, finally, the efficiency is the best thing part. There is a secret source that is actually uh, for you. And you can use this. And please try this at home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful work. I'm wondering if uh, you changed the gas to dust ratio. Or if you leave that, I think that could be very relevant for the very high red to So what if I change the dust to gas ratio? And that's the basically the particular model that I considered here. So basically I change it uh, gas of metallicity and dust abundance together. And at the lower metallicity, then we know that there is evidence of the even lower dust abundance. And that's uh, basically this model. And in terms of the star formation wave regulation, they were not uh, very uh, sensitive to this ratio. One reason is because the uh, uh, 
Well, I think the main reason is there is another source of like heating, which is post wave ionization heating that doesn't depend on the dust alignment. But up to this, at this point, actually, uh, although the radiation, UV radiation can propagate further, but the, now the actually the heating is provided by the ionization. And that prescription, you know, is pretty uncertain, but we have a, our best effort there. Yeah. Why don't we see if there's one more question while well, Bruce comes up and we change the slides? I should also say that uh, at the end of each morning and each afternoon, there is a 30 minute discussion session. So uh, please keep in mind your uh, questions or just general topics that you want to see discussed during those times. Okay, let's thank Chang Wu again. Where did all of the speakers <laughs> go? The speaker from not so far away from New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. Stone's Jersey. Stone's Jersey. Okay. We're just going to solve all the mysteries in the universe for us. Well, I'm going to ask the question that for us. Um, so previously, Deidre Hunter and I and a couple of other people looked at correlations between um, velocity dispersion of H1 gas on a 100 parsec scale and local star formation. Removing the average radio profile. So, this is the dispersion excess of the local average. So, on the vertical axis is that dispersion for dwarfs or spiral galaxies. On the horizontal axis is the excess star formation. And there's no correlation. This is somewhat predicted by the pressure driven feedback model because we balance higher star formation rate, we get higher surface densities of gas. So, that extra energy carry down here, and we get a higher the same kind of velocity dispersion. Now I'm looking at CO in the FANG survey. And this is a strong R galaxy, as you see, 4221, and there is a correlation between sigma and star formation rate density. But there's also correlations between sigma and excess molecular surface density and between excess surface density and star formation. And this shows the burial plan. So we have to ask ourselves, does the velocity dispersion really correlate with star formation because of feedback, or is it correlating with the molecules and the molecules correlating with feedback. Is the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart? And we're not seeing much cloud dispersion at all because of the burial pattern is constant. That was a strong iron galaxy, same for a weak iron galaxy with a range of star formation rates as a factor of 10 more. These are for all the galaxies in phase with stellar masses greater than 2 to 10 to the 10 with enough of CO observations. 17 strong arm galaxies and 17 weak arms because of the lesser star formation range. The weak arm galaxies are red here. They uh, correspond to different uh, locus on this correlation. They all have the same correlations you've seen. These are the object based GMC measurements where they zero in the individual molecular clouds, measure the properties. This is for pixel based 150 parcel pixels, both averaged inside those hexagrams of 1.5 kpc. So these are the azimuthal variations, and everything correlates very well. Now these are the total parameters. This is everything, all the radii, all the galaxies, all the azimuth. So this first one here, velocity dispersion versus molecules, that's a Larson model. This one here, the molecular uh, surface density versus star formation, that's the molecular chemical Schmidt law. And this is the combination, velocity dispersion versus star formation rate. And again, alpha is uh, pretty uh, uniform. Similarly, for mass, here's the Larson law for mass velocity dispersion versus molecular mass, or molecular mass versus star formation rate. Right? And this would be for the strong spirals, weak spirals, these are for the object based measurements. Okay, so what did we learn? The full correlations are entirely responsible for the azimuthal variations. The azimuthal variations are linear. And the slope there is exactly what you get from the power law of the full correlation, the Larson law, the Kennecott Schmidt law, at the average values. And these numbers show you for all four cases strong, weak, and object versus person. So the azimuthal fluctuations are following the total GMC correlations with a near constant star formation efficiency. Velocity dispersion is increasing with star formation rate entirely because both are increasing with the molecular mass. So Velocity dispersion does not increase following star formation because 
Velocity dispersion increases with molecular mass, and the molecular mass doesn't suddenly increase when star formation turns on. So now we've got the current problem of us. There's no evidence of feedback in the velocity dispersion of CO. So now let's look at the dynamical equilibrium pressure you just heard about. It has a gas self gravity term and a force of stars on the gas inside the gas layer. So it has a thickness of the gas determined by the gas velocity dispersion, which contains a magnetic and, and forces. These are the azimuthal variations. This is the total correlation in a power law. They are both very tight correlations, and they're present for both weak and strong spirals. And weak spirals are shifted a bit to star formation rate. They are uh, both satisfied in the azimuth and the total by the same relationship. So again, the azimuthal variations are just following the total power law. So the implication is here's the relationship I derived. It's not so much different from the previous static study, although uh, steeper than the Ostriker and Kim simulation result. But that slope is not so important. It depends on the radio profile of thickness and velocity dispersion, which is usually assumed, and, and you can get different values. If it is truly nonlinear, like I find, and it is certainly global, it's in all the galaxies and all the radio and all the azimuths. That implies this feedback efficiency has to be very tightly regulated to the star formation rate. And that's a challenge for simulations. On the other hand, prior to this thinking about pressure following star formation as a feedback effect, there's been for a long time a very tight universal nonlinear correlation between star formation and surface density of gas, the kind of constant relation. So I'm asking here is this feedback thinking? Really, just the Kennecott Schmidt law turned back. So, the pressure um, dynamical equilibrium has two terms. This first one is just, as I said, the gas on itself, and this is stars on gas. This is essentially the Kennecott Schmidt relation shown here. The, the different power doesn't matter here. I plot the first term here. You just get a slightly different slope. And by the way, in all the things data I'm using, I, I determined the Kennecott Schmidt relation comes out just fine. So this is the first term now in the of PDE. And here's the second term. This is the extended Kennecott Schmidt law, which contains, according to the sheet model, the square root of the stellar surface density. They both fit just fine in my observations, both the azimuthal variations and the total global. Very tight correlations. And here they are again. They have the same slope. So you sum them, you're going to get that slope anyway. This is the ratio of the two terms. Generally, the second term dominates. The stellar pressures dominate. So there are two ways of looking at this. The pressures, these two terms, as functional of star formation rate, you think of feedback. But if you write the star formation rate as a function of these proxies for density, then you think of kinetic regulation. So which is the first way of thinking is the pressure regulated. A feedback model. You think large scale turbulence caused by feedback gives you star formation regulation because it pops up the disk. It's like controlling the pressure, it shows the thickness, therefore the average density, which determines all the time scales for uh, gravity in the disk. The second way is much more of an emphasis on galactic dynamics and the efficiency of star formation that can be very local, right in GMCs. Large scale ISM turbulence does not have to be all from feedback. It can be from many different galactic processes, including um, density wave shock, Q self stabilization, which is dominated by stars. Also, these processes also make GMCs, as we know. Density wave compression, shell compression. Dense collapse makes GMC turbulence. Local feedback makes more GMC turbulence, erodes GMCs, the things you're hearing here. And the question is, how far does it get? Where does that feedback go? Does it go all the way up to the full thickness of the disk and regulate in model one, or just, just stay locally and regulate by breaking apart the plane? So now I'm looking at star formation on a galactic scale. So these are Kennecott type laws. We have the star formation surface density versus total gas times a rate. I'm taking three galactic rates. This is epicyclic, this is shear, this is a rotation. They all give Beautiful correlations for global total gas, and here in the excess, it's similarly good correlations. Where now the slope is unity. These are linear relationships. So if you want the best predictor of star formation, it's something that has to do with a galactic rate using all the gas together, because this is a linear relationship. 
I hear the powers. One plus minus point three. So in conclusion, the velocity spurs of CO and the circumstances of star formation, what we follow the molecular mass. There's no evidence for a unique dependence of this velocity dispersion on star formation from feedback. PDE and the circumstances of star formation co-vary very tightly and have the same relation in azimuth. So my question is, is this because of feedback where I think of this terms? Or because of the chaos relation where I think of it the inverse terms? And we already know this is a tight relation. So the challenge on the theoreticians is to show that this is important. And what is the relative importance of feedback versus lactic dynamics for both turbulence and the star formation rate? And as a function of scale as well. Is one entirely local, the other by the scale, it's a function of time scale as well. And then you saw these this linear correlation between electric dynamics. We have to keep remembering the electric dynamical processes because they're important as well. So it's truly a mixture, it's both of these. But what are the scales for each? What are the proportions of each? And what's happening on the galactic? I mean, there's several regulatory processes for sure. Q is, Q is rather steady. The, the efficiency of star is rather steady. There's lots of regulation. But what is happening where? And I think we don't know. And that's why I'm asking, where does the feedback go? But we don't see it. Like what Bruce said, tied right into like phase introduction. But the hard problem is on all scales. Yeah, yeah. Like scales as well. Daniela. And I'm sorry to hear the question. Yeah, thanks. So, question. What if you have dwarfs? Are they of those type of relations? Because dwarfs don't, they don't have a large scale dynamics like you see. Yes, what if the dwarfs are the study? The variable scale and dwarfs are the little ones. The four stops. I mean, the legal seal is because, I mean, the legal yeah. seal is that they can control the their gas and it's easy to get their seal to be. Yeah, so the question is where did Borscht fit into this? Right. And, and, and I can't answer that in these terms. And as we look at dwarfs a lot. And the first 15 years of that, we found a very stable disks, high Qs, couldn't figure out anything. But now, looking more closely, we think there's a lot of hidden H2, which is not present. And now it looks like you can be very well, uh, of course, if you want to, even in dwarfs with a lot of dark molecules. So dwarfs are starting to look more normal, but I can't say that these kinds of things are present. Hi, uh, I think uh, many of these will be a nice discussion for people. Yeah. Uh, but I think the one thing that I want to comment is the, the last part uh, where you said the star formation rate is the catastrophic uh, rate uh, is linear relation. But I think the another issue there is always this kind of efficiency kind of dynamic kind there. And then you need to 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 this to be the more like a theoretically appealing uh, theory, I think you need the explanation for why this has one percent and I think the one thing that uh, from the PR plan point of view, that, uh, I think the, uh, our strength that we think is that we can actually give you the reason why this efficiency is small because of the Yeah, that's, so the question is, the, the statement is that in plots like this, we know nothing about what determines the height of this, that is the efficiency. And so detailed models like yours can tell us the answer to that. I'm still stuck on whether these beautiful simulations have enough dynamical range to contain both the galaxy and all its subparsic stuff. Are you losing a lot of energy on that in the dense GMC environments where the energy radiated efficiently, or where it's hard to push clouds around with that momentum? So there's still a question where the feedback comes. They're absolutely right. Should be able to tie this down. And there, there are a couple of 1% theories floating around in the years as well. 
So someone that picks the famous galaxy loves bar galaxies. There's a beautiful bar. Yeah, there, there are bars. 1365. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1300, God knows what I'm saying. Um, talking about galactic dynamics, did you break it up? No. Bars through? Do you have a prediction? No. <laughs> did you think about it? <laughs> um, so the question is, uh, where did bars, the distinction that bars make fit into this picture? Uh, 1300, for example, was a wee dumb galaxy. It had hardly any variation because it had, even though it's a grand design, it's fairly thin arms. So there are strong arms and, and weak arms, even among the bars. And I didn't distinguish between in the bar or out of the bar. I know there's a paper, there's a bank paper that actually does that, finds more efficiency in the bars. So I didn't do that. Okay, and with that, well, I'd like to thank all the speakers. <laughs> I also need to start Just go ahead. Yeah. 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 well, I guess the last thing you want to do is have somebody uh, talk interrupted by a. Uh, we have trying to just, just yeah. A no, not that much. No, I think it's because, because then people the sitting at the back, you know, about the like yeah. seventy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because there's so much space. So right. this will come in like another 15 minutes. He's on to SDS. So I think all we really need to do is find the stuff there. The little foot doesn't go any higher. So it looks like it auto adjusts when you yeah. move it. So we can find something that's, you know, probably a little thicker than that. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, that's part. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this was. What about this? I'm, you know, saying. Yeah, that might work. You know, it may be by the time it's bad, everything together. I think it's, I hear I'm, I'm worried about that. So, what we can do now? Seriously, just like. Sorry, no, no, I okay. just wanted to check that we can do that. Yeah, I said. Okay, so that might be okay. Oh, you want to say okay because yeah, I know it's good to check. Yes, it should work. That's pretty good. Yeah, so um, I'm coming to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's good. So then this other one, though, the other one. Yes, all the talks are in this computer. I will change it because I know the folder where this is happening. Okay. Uh, and likewise, we are trying to find a replacement for this one. Uh, we talked to the person. Else, I think what you could do is that you could just send. Are people wearing your mic? Yeah, people are wearing your mic. Oh, they're wearing your mic. Okay. Switch it off right now. Batteries. Uh, this is for the human use. But in case the other mic doesn't survive. Yeah, sure. Of course. That's about it. But we are we trying to find like a little bit of 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 I think this is fine. This is good. Much better. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So better. I think we'll, yeah. We'll take a look at this one too. I don't know if this is fine. Yeah. 
No, I check. Yeah, check. So since Google Slides should be straightforward. Each uh, one, it should. Yeah. Since, but since like we were told to use either uh, P not. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, so so there's a PPTX. I I see. Ah, this is your okay. Then then it should be fine. No, but uh, it I don't know if this has the animations. Can can I scroll down? And... You can also put them in present mode. Yeah, I can see the image. Okay, good. Uh, is it possible to grab the latest version because I fixed a typo? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry for the trouble. What is? Uh, where did you send it? Uh, on the. It's on. The, it's in the Google Drive. In the Google Drive. Yes. I have to find. Uh, so the Google Drive. I will. Uh, okay, I will find because it's. I don't have it here. Okay. Okay. Uh, were you able to check your slides? Uh, yes, I was just so I think yeah, Google Slides. Well. I did. Yeah. yeah. So I was just like I fixed a typo. So I was just wondering if you could pull the latest version. Yeah, of course. Uh, is it on block? Oh, sorry. If it's on box. Google slides. I can. It's on. Uh, it's it's on the Google Drive thing. So if if, if you have Slack here, I can send it. Send it uh, yeah. Can you send me the link on? Uh, I'm it. Uh, not Slack. Can you send it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Are you uploading on Box? Yeah. If, okay. if you can upload on Box, I can grab it from there. Yeah, that is why because from here I couldn't find it. Yeah, Google Slides had this weird thing where it was loading some of the animations and then it wasn't. So yeah, okay. So do you mind if I just like remove that? Can you send it to me? Did you send the? Did you send me the presentation? Slack. Yeah. Can you send me this link? <laughs> <laughs> 
presentation. Oh, no, sorry. That's so weird. <laughs> if you want to so present a paper discussion, that's also yeah. fine. I, I Very unique. Uh, so fun, yeah. Uh, so didn't you get a jacket? Yeah. You want a sweater, by the way? No. I have a, like a very thick sweater. Like, I, I do have one, like, if you want it. Yeah. I have my jacket, but it's not. The uh... advice is to not turn them yeah. off. Yeah. Hmm? The advice is to not turn them off at work. So okay. Just, is it the same thing? So you yes. change frequencies, and it's just like, maybe if it turns off, it has a hard time reconnecting. It's like... it is okay. Yeah, it's a PowerPoint. It should be. Okay. I, I've never done, like, I, I haven't had PowerPoint for, like, the last 14 years, so. Okay. Everything's just on slides. I don't think I've used a program forever. It's all in the browser. I've always used, like, PowerPoint or Keynotes or something, mainly because of animations. Or I don't know if Google Slides allows that. Like, I don't usually have animations. Okay. I usually just have, like, slide transitions. Okay. And so it's so, it's extremely easy. this. Uh, maybe keep it with you because yeah. I'm downloading it. Thank you so much. Take the time. Sorry for the trouble. Uh, yeah, Tim. I love Bellissimo. Okay. So it goes from slides to drive, drive to box, box to the show. No, but that was and for today. Oh, okay. yeah, it's just for well, today is a mess. I mean, uh, with, given that we have to host it here yeah. and like we don't like completely but, know this. Do you know in advance is uh, like. Uh, we knew this like uh, I saw a little more than a month ago. Oh, gosh, and then month, since, okay. Yeah. Since then, we have been like scrambling to get a place here. Yeah, yeah. Like, we, we've been thinking about like more than that 160, yeah. 170 or so. Tomorrow, it might be more because space telescope people might will also join there. Ah, Sarah, I promise tomorrow there'll be tea. Like, good one, <laughs> good tea. <laughs> Okay, I put it down. Well, I'll, I'll bring my own. That case. I don't like to be quite on the right side. I'm not a regular one. I like to be on the right side. I'm not a regular one. I like to be on the right side. I'm not a regular one. I'm that uh, rejected thing because I could not create anything. Yeah, we yeah, we, we just put like yeah, yeah, yeah. a tissue paper and an adapter. <laughs> That's That's good. Good. Yeah. High tech. <laughs> That's dynamic. <laughs> so we have another New York talk, right? I suppose. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me close these. All right, I'm just going to keep this here. Oh, it's the one up. 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 It's I should just remember that you another one. I'm, I'm usually I'm used to like all the format and everything going to have and export it as well. Okay, so this is a very pleasant surprise. No, 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 no. I can't do it. So I'm just using a little bit. Yeah, so if you want to check your slides, we can do that now. PPT, but I also send the PDF. Okay. So the Hamel Bravo? Yes. So just have a look. Do you have any animations or something like that? No. Which one is the Uh Yeah, that's the one to one slide. So maybe you might want to step away from the. That would be a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Right? Good. Excellent. So, okay, your talk, I don't remember which. 
Uh, maybe it was a two or three o'clock thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Schedule somewhere for sharing since I can, so I can. Janet had one, and I'm looking for her. I can find her. She might be outside. Okay. So, so I can pass something to I can, I can give you my computer. Oh, I have my computer. Well, maybe I don't know. I can give you my computer. Maybe she left because she did the trade with me. Well, I don't know. 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 I do Yeah. <laughs> 
Sure. Not all words coming. Some people are along the way. Yeah. 
Yeah, right now it's in the center. You see, whenever whenever a new speaker comes, okay, I tell us chance to move. Let me see if I can move it. I can move. Where did it go? Today it is actually. Let me let me move it actually. Let me move it away from that. I mean, if it's if it stays like that, it's like like like, like in this case, in this case, you're not seeing it. Okay, that's also it's fine. Actually, yeah. That's yeah. that's of course better. But... Yes, yeah. It's yeah, on this really side. Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm as as an audience, I think I was seeing this this window. Yeah. I was seeing this window. And... There, but I don't see it now. So I think on the way that that's what the remote people are saying. That's oh, it's a slight change. This was a slide. Yeah. Okay, then there's definitely much better. Thank you. All right. Okay. Darshan was handling the slides. Yeah, so I should have this one up here. Number one, yeah, you have a
So in brief, AlmaQuest is a sample of 66 galaxies that we've selected from Lambda, which is a large optical IFU survey from the, from the Sloan family. And then we followed these 66 galaxies up with CO1 to zero observations that we've obtained. And so we have been very careful to match the angular resolution of our ALMA observations with Magda. So for these 66 galaxies, we have approximately kiloparsec scale measurements of uh, the various properties that we can measure from Magda. So things like the star formation rate surface densities, stellar mass surface densities, metallicities, emission line fluxes, uh, and then the, the CO uh, surface density. Very important characteristic of the AlmaQuest selection is that the galaxies are extremely diverse. So we have some that are on the star forming main sequence. We have some that are starbursts. Many of these are mergers. We also have galaxies in the Green Valley and some that are mergers. So this diversity gives us a long lever arm to test the various mechanisms that both boost and quench star formation in the early So I'm going to focus on really just three observational quantities, these three surface densities. So the one that we get from ALMA, the surface density of the molecular gas, and then the surface densities of the stellar mass, the star formation rate that we can extract at the molecular gas. So as we've already seen this morning, it's very common practice in the community to combine these surface densities into the scale relation. So you can combine these three quantities pairwise, three different ways to get three different scale relations. Uh, so first up is the so-called star forming sequence. So the star formation rate versus stellar mass. Next up is the Schmidt-Kennicott relation, which is the star formation rate versus the molecular mass. And then the third way to combine them gives you the so-called molecular gas main sequence, which is the molecular gas and the stellar mass. So none of these correlations are new. I'm just showing you here the AlmaQuest view. So we have about 20,000 uh, spaxels across these 66 counts. And as you can see, we see these strong correlations in all three of these scaling relations. So then it shouldn't be surprising to see that if we plot them in three dimensions, we can see this sort of cigar shaped structure. So these black individual points are the positions of individual kiloparsec scale spaxels. And then we can project that onto any of the two dimensional planes to recover the three different scaling relations. So, this was the very first AlmaQuest paper that we put out back in 2019, led by Yu Hui Lin. And in it, we discussed which of these scaling relations is truly fundamental because you don't need all three to make this structure, you only need two. And so, Yu Hui argued based on both the strength of the correlation and the scatters around them, that the schmidt kennicutt and the molecular gas main sequences were the relations that set this relation up, and that the star forming main sequence was really just a byproduct. We then had a follow-up paper that was led by William Baker, in which we asked the same question, but using a more sophisticated analysis technique. Uh, so what William did in his paper was to use this random forest regression technique uh, and the essence of this approach is that you choose some target variable. So in this case, we're asking the question, what drives star formation? So your target variable is the surface density of the star formation. Rate. And then you can give the random forest as many input variables as you like, and you ask it to compute their relative importance. And that's what you're seeing on this bar chart. And so what William found was that if what you care about is knowing the star formation rate, it is the surface density of the molecular gas that is by far the most important, certainly much more so than the stellar mass. So this was an independent verification in the AlmaQuest data that the Schmidt-Kennicott relation is more fundamental than the stellar mass. Okay, all well and good. However, this work so far is really just looking at these raw observational quantities. It doesn't try to capture any underlying physics model. So that's where we wanted to go next. So uh, this morning's or rather the pre-coffee break talks have set this up beautifully. You've heard all about these pressure regulated feedback models or yes, PRFM uh, family of models, but just a very brief recap. The idea here is that there is a balance in the uh, in the disk 
between the feedback that you get from the stellar populations and the pressure that is felt, which is a combination of the gas, cell gravity, and the sun. Exactly the same equation that these have. So the prediction is that the pressure and the star formation rate should track each other very closely. And this is a figure from the Australian in 2022 paper. Uh, so Chang Yi talked about the Tigris models in his talk. Those predictions are shown uh, in the black line here. And then the colored data points are showing our observational data sets from uh, Edge Khalifa and Banks, for example. And you can see that there is a very, very good match. Where AlgaQuest comes in is that the observational data sets shown in this plot are all very well behaved normal star formations. Whereas, as I mentioned on my early slide, with AlgaQuest, we have starbursts, we have mergers, we have quenching analyses. And so we can now test this PRFM model in more extreme uh, ranges. So here is that dynamical equilibrium pressure relation for AlgaQuest. So the dynamical pressure. Star formation rates. The PRFO model is shown in the red line and then the alpha. So at first blush, it looks pretty good. Uh, the model line goes through where most of the data are. But if we look a little bit more carefully, we can see that the AlmaQuest data don't just have this nice linear relation. There is a sort of apparent break, there's a bit of a need here, such that at high pressures we have a flatter relation. <laughs> So we can understand that if we break the galaxies down into subsides. So what I'm showing you here is on the left, these are the normal star forming rates of this galaxy. For those whose global star formation rates are within uh, plus minus 0.3 depths of the main star. These galaxies are in excellent agreement with the PR. However, if I look at the starburst galaxies, so those who have got star formation rates at least 0.3 depths above the star forming main sequence. That is what is causing the flattening, particularly at high pressures. And so it's the combination of these two relations that gives us this, uh, this curvature. Okay, so then the question should be, is there some tweak that we can make to this model that allows it to uh, better represent the data in uh, more diverse environments. Also, Blakesley mentioned in her talk this morning, the Krumholtz uh, family model. So here there is this extra um, component of turbulence that uh, comes preferentially from radial inflows. And so I'm showing those Krumholtz models here in the orange. Uh, so there's a three parameter, which is the orbital time. So I'm showing three, uh, three different versions of that. Um, the AlmaQuest data is still in green, but I've also overplotted now uh, further literature data, the edge cleaver and the bangs data as well. So you can see that the Krumholz models have this flattening at high pressures that is more characteristic of what we see. Okay, so summary so far, there is this relationship in the AlmaQuest data and in the other observational data sets between the star formation rate and the pressure. Uh, they're best represented by uh, models that have this additional turbulence. But then we can return to the question of now which of these four scaling relations is fundamental. So we've already weighed up whether the star for main sequence or the schmidt kennecke relation are the ones driving uh, the star formation. Now we can add the dynamical equilibrium pressure into the mix. Into so just to remind you, this is the figure that I showed you from the data now. Uh, paper. Uh, we can now redo this random forest, but now put in the pressure as an additional input variable. So what you can see is that the pressure is now by far the most important predictor of my star formation rate, much higher even than the molecular gas alone, which before had been the limit. Now you might say, well, maybe there's a bit of smoke and mirrors here because this dynamical equilibrium in the room pressure includes contributions from both that and star. So you're giving your model more information. So of course it's going to do better. So we try to test that by uh, including in our input variable um, those that are either just the extended Schmidt Kennecke relation or uh, a combination of variables that follows via the exponents, the dynamical pressure equilibrium that doesn't have all of the other ingredients. We also had a random uh, variable in here as well with the combinations. 
And you can see that none of them are even approaching the performance for that answer. So there does seem to be something it truly captured by, by BD that is able to, to reduce the stuff. Okay, so in summary, uh, I told you about the ALMAQUEST survey. So 66 galaxies, manga observations, plus CO on to zero for Palma. Um, our goal has been to try to quantify which of the scaling relations are most important. We've been focusing on the surface density and uh, the PDE. We show that there is a strong PDE relation in ALMAQUEST. Uh, it's better represented by the Krumholtz model than by the MFM. Um, and it is uh, it outranks the schmidt haircut relation in terms of the Rachel? Oh. No New Jersey speaker, but New Jersey question. <laughs> we have to get our words out. Beautiful stuff, Sarah, and uh, great talk. So, two questions. One, um, you haven't mentioned, of course, it was a short talk, whether there are uncertainties in FCO, which, of course, depend on lots of other things, and you know, that folds in. And the reason I'm wondering that is I'm wondering whether there's any prospects. For studying the kinds of metallicity dependence that, that Chang Yi was, was seeing in these simulations. Right. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I can't believe I actually got through a whole first session without having any XCO uh, questions. Um, so, of course, there's always an uncertainty. So, we try a number of different approaches. So, what I've shown you here is just using a galactic value, a custom 4.3 value. Uh, but we tried it with metricity dependence, we tried it with the sigma dependence. So it shifts things around. What it can't do is get rid of this rate. Um, in terms of the metricity dependence that uh, Chang'e was talking about, so um, I should let him, him speak, but uh, it looked as if it is a, just a vertical offset. So you still have a linear relation. So it doesn't, again, that might take things. No, no, it wouldn't change that, but yeah. I wonder if in your start, in your normal, Galaxy sample to test whether that shift in the normal rotation is present by oh I see so, so we do so we do have measurements of metricity so so yes that I think is the but can I just follow up so you did or did not look at like whether the scatter could be could be reproduced by or, or impacted by changing FCO for different galaxies yeah so we do that that's right so we so we recomputed PDE with a variety of different SEOs, and we also try changing assumptions on other variables mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the sort of qualitative outcome doesn't change. The other thing that I, I think is important to note is that even with all of these observational uncertainties, PDE still comes out on top. So even if we've got things wrong mm -hmm. in some measure, which which we have because we always have to make uh, we always have to make some assumptions, and we have measurement uncertainties. It still comes out the strongest. So um, usually, if you mess things up, you weaken the thing. Sure, sure. But um, I guess the thing is, again, the analog to the metallicity relation is that you didn't get rid of it; you just learned more stuff. Yeah, exactly. So. Thanks. So nice. Um, so I'm slightly confused how to interpret the last point of the PDE, even when you account for combinations of the surface density. So, so what else? What, what other information is PDE that's small? So you have this term. Then this is the sum of the molecular and the Atomic. So, so our next speaker is next year, is the Metallic Biology Holding Star Formation across. Time and time scale with JWST and Campbell. Can you put your Is that your first slide? 
Yes. Yes. I'll give you a, I'll give you a warning at eight minutes. Yep. Uh, where's the? Oh, it's fine. All right, wonderful. So it's time for a show and tell, or not. Uh, my name is Karthik Ayer. I am not from Jersey, but I did my PhD there. <laughs> um, I spent some time in Canada too, so I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling well in place. But today I want to tell you about some exciting stuff that we have been doing, looking at uh, how star formation happens in galaxies uh, and how we can get at that from observations and then how we can connect that to physics using simulations. So let's start in a place where both theorists and observers feel comfortable. So here the x-axis is stellar mass, y is star formation rate, and let's add a third axis for time. Uh, there's many other parameter spaces. I'm just choosing this one for reasons. Now, when we look at multi-wavelength observations of galaxies, we measure the pulse density at different wavelengths and use that to determine things like how many stars they have, the rate at which they're making new stars, and how far they are from us. Doing this allows us to put a galaxy on this plane, often with posterior distributions because everything's a probability. And then we can look both at individual galaxies that have very interesting physics going on and have been privileged to be a part of a lot of these studies. So if, if you want to talk about these, please let me know. Uh, but we also then ask questions like, when did the first galaxies form? Or really, what happens to galaxies at the extremely low mass end? And so when we start asking these questions, we often build theories of how galaxies evolve by collecting populations of galaxies, and then either connecting them using scaling relations and seeing how those relations evolve over time after the lecture, or slicing and dicing this in many different ways and computing things like mass functions or the cosmic star formation rate density and using that to put constraints on the acceptable ranges in which the physics of galaxy evolution can operate to create these populations. So the thing that I want to uh, bring to this table in addition to all the incredible work that has been done in this regard is that individual galaxies are incredibly diverse. Everyone here knows this. But the upshot of this is that when we look at how the average galaxy evolves and use that to try to explain individual galaxies, that often falls short. And so what I'm advocating here is to try to get temporal information for individual galaxies that would make each galaxy here not a single point at a given mass and redshift, uh, but a track that evolves in time. And so that brings us to the three uh, halves of the start that I want to uh, briefly touch on. The first is how can we get this information out of the observation? The second is, especially with the higher actual JWST observations, people have been thinking a lot about the burstiness of short time scales to plasticity of star formation. And so I want to talk about how you can get at that, not with single galaxies, but with small populations of galaxies. And the third one is now, if we have this information, how do we actually connect this to the strength of feedback using single? Let's jump in. So for the longest time, because we were limited by the amount of data that we had, we often resorted to using simple parametric models for star formation histories, like exponential models that were zero up until a time, short up, and then declined exponentially until observation. The problem with this, especially in studies where you want to connect populations across redshifts, is that they're not self-consistent. What this means is that if you take a galaxy and propagate it back in time, you either end up with it completely dropping off or with it having a ridiculously high star formation rate at, at an early time because it's forced to rise exponentially. And so when you use this to construct things like the uh, cosmic as a party, it just doesn't match. So because of this, we have been looking at these things called non-parametric star formation histories. And the very simple definition of this is that we don't assume a functional form for the star formation history. And we have a number of parameters that describe the overall shape that's usually set by the quality of the data. So there's many ways of doing this. Perhaps the simplest way is to just divide time into bins and then have the, the star formation rate in each bin be a three parameter. But the issue with this is that you end up needing a lot of numbers, which is really hard to estimate from uh, multivalent spectral data, which often has other covariates like dust and multiplicity and things that you need to understand. So this is also really important when you want to do things like uh, connect the galaxy to its progenitors in time using more information than just the 
uh, step mass and SF1. If you want to use the SF edge information, then you need to make sure that it's fixed. So the approach that I've been using uh, to get out of this is to define our start meeting history in terms of these two points, uh, where Px is the, the time at which a galaxy found a fraction x of its mass. So T50 would be when it found 50% of its total mass. And this set of TX parameters tends to encode information about the shape of the star mystery. So even with a small number of TX parameters, you can end up getting a lot of flexibility in what the overall shape of the history looks like without needing to adopt any particular function form. Great. Does this actually work? Yes, because when we actually look at an ensemble of observations and look at things across mass and across redshift, you see the evolution going from these steeply rising submission displays on average at the low mass high redshift end, going all the way to massive choice and galaxies at low redshifts. So uh, this is all public. If you're interested in doing this, if you do an observation, feel free to do so. Contact me for an extra level. And the interesting thing is that this has now been extended and incorporated into something called Pixel Fit, which works with resolved as you can. So what this means is that now you can do Spaxel by Spaxel or Pixel by Pixel, stellar population analysis if you have observations. All right, so takeaway here is that we can use these non parametric methods to reconstruct robust star formation histories for a variety of purposes. Okay. The second thing is having done the sort of long time scale overall behavior, we also want to think about the fluctuations around that. So we know that star formation tends to be quite stochastic. This is often called burstiness, although I'm not a big fan of that word because burstiness tends to be on a single time scale. And really, if you think about the underlying physics, this sort of um, stochastic star formation is correlated across a range of time scales driven by things like things. And so if you want to model this, you want to create a model that has the ability to introduce fluctuations in the star formation histories where you can change both the amount of fluctuation, but also the time scale on which this fluctuations are correlated. So beyond this time scale, it looks like uncorrelated star formation, and within this, it looks like a So working with those people, we made this uh, pretty simple model that has uh, three time scales for gas inflows, baryon cycling, and dynamical effects like GMC creation and destruction. And we made a simple Python package where you can just literally set the values of these parameters and sample star formation histories that are stochastic in different regimes. So you can have Milky Way like things that are not very bursty and quite correlated, or you can have high say like things that are quite bursty and correlated on extremely short time scales. <laughs> and then what you can do is take this and forward model spectra and inspect the features, and then you can start doing inference. Then you do inference by comparing a distribution of spectral features to that of an observation. You realize that, yeah, the one galaxy we can't really constrain anything, but with as little as 30 to 50 galaxies, you can start getting constraints on the time, uh, the amount and the time scale of the, of the stochastic set. So that's the takeaway from this part. And again, if you're interested in this, let me know. The third part is like we, we now got both the long time scale and the short time scale information from the observations. How do we tie this to the physics? So this is work in breadth, uh, but the ideal case would be if we had a simulation where we could change all the feedback in any way we want. The reason we want to be able to do this in multiple ways is because things like stellar and AGM feedback tend to be correlated. So if you study the effect of changing only one thing, keeping the other constant, we often don't get the full picture of how these actually regulate the variant content and things like the growth of the supermassive black hole in the galaxies. So here I'm building the suite of simulations called CAMELS, which has a thousand runs each of Ellipsis TNG, of Sunda, and of Astrid, varying the cosmology and varying two supernova feedback and two AGN feedback parameters. So this is showing the star formation histories in one box where you have lower energy for supernova and slightly faster wind speeds, and the star formation history tracks that result from the setup. And then here's another one where variance cycling is more efficient because of this sort of set of feedback parameters and star formation tends to happen over a long, longer period of time. So the thing you can do here is to then look at the effect of changing these feedback parameters on the histories. <coughs> 
but also looking not directly, not just at the single parameter effects like change in the wind speed changes the amount of stress form in this case, but you can also look at interaction terms. How does this look like when you change the agent feedback in conjunction to the wind speed? Does it have the same effect? Does it increase it? Does it suppress it or change it altogether? And so uh, more of this a year later, hopefully in the talk, but it looks like we can connect signatures in the South Machine space to the strength of the different feedback rooms. And with that, I want to thank everyone who contributed to this. None of this research would be possible without the support and guidance. And I'll leave my conclusion slide up. A quick bonus, uh, Juan Alfonso, who's here in uh, person, is a brilliant student who recently put out a paper that gets stuff mission space from galaxy images instead of spectra and then tries to figure out which part of the image contributed to the prediction. So if you're around, please go that way. Thank you very much. Talk. So I just wonder for part two when you're trying to get the time scale for the yeah. for I just can you give us a quick intuitive um, example of what kind of observable are uh, yeah I'm, I'm sorry the, the sort of corner plot is actually quite small. So the basic thing you want is observables that are sensitive to a range of time scales. So in this case, the things are uh, the HL plus strength, the FUV, the H delta, and the DN total break. So between those, you tend to get information that spans a reasonably wide range of time scales and allows you to like break the region to see that you would have it, say, just HL plus FUV. Because the thing with HL plus FUV is like you can get an amount of burstiness, but you don't know whether that's all the burstiness transported into a short correlation time thing, or it's a slice or something that's happening on the long term. Uh, five. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's two versions. So if you think that your observations can actually do the GMC part, then five. Uh, if not, the basic gas regulator model is three. So it's an overall scatter and then two more two parameters for uh, inflow time scale. And nothing about uh, pre-parameters and the other ones are published. So those are all on top. Yeah. So that that gets added on. So it's these three plus whatever prescription you're using for dust and metal acid weight. Uh, it, it really comes down to also what data you're getting. So uh, things like selection functions. The nice thing is we're using the setup called simulation based inference. And so what we do is we make the setup where as a function of the three parameters, it creates a realistic set of forward models with selection biases and all these other things factored in. And then it fits to the So uh, some of those ethics get like you 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 can in the pre training step realize what can be considered on this one. Should I take the question? Yeah. I think I might be a little bit. If at some point you get to the point, let me try repeating the question and you can tell me if I got yeah. yeah. So, first question Have you tested the staff engagement state of the simulation? Uh, answer is yes, it's in the, the, the 2017 and the 2019 paper, and it works beautifully uh, in, in sort of recovering the overall stop emission state down to like point, point 0.2 dex, go to the time of observation, and 0.3 bar of the uh, And we also compared it against some stop emission states from telematic data. So, yes, validation tests are that. Uh, second part, do you? Uh, 
uh, run up against a fundamental information limit in what you can extract from your observations. And so in in the 2019 paper, the way we dealt with this is by keeping the number of parameters flexible and asking the data to decide that for us using model comparison tests. So saying that like if the data can only extract one parameter, then it will, and if it can get more, then it will. But at some point it will saturate, especially when we get to some science festivals. And so that's a case by case thing. So our next speaker is Viola Jelly, and she's going to be telling us about open stochastic star formation and the first galaxies of the state. So take it away. Thanks. Hello, everyone. So I'm Viola Jelly, uh, first speaker for another continent. I'm from Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, because we don't center. And OK, let me start by uh, I already had the time. Uh, talks we already heard that introduced this topic. So the fact that one of the very first PWSP <laughs> results that have been discussed a lot has been the high abundance of UV bright galaxies at very high redshift. And this manifests in a very shallow evolution of the luminosity functions at these redshifts. And to understand, to try to understand why this happens, we need to understand what drives the UV brightness of galaxies, which is basically related to the star formation rate of these galaxies, which is in turn regulated by the mass, the halo mass, and by the star formation efficiency, so the fraction of gas that is transformed into stars. So many theories have been proposed in the past year to try to enhance the uh, UV luminosities, and this can consist in either enhancing the star formation efficiency itself, or we can uh, think of more top heavy initial mass functions, or just free radiation. But today I want to explore a different scenario, which is the possibility that this relation between the UV magnitudes and the halo mass of galaxies maybe is not a side relation, but it's rather characterized by a scatter. So a scatter which can be uh, described by a sigma UV in the relation between UV and the image. And the reason why I believe this uh, possibility is interesting because there is increasing evidence for the physical processes that will have exactly uh, this effect, which is uh, what uh, has been now talking about, which is uh, stochastic star formation. And there is increasing evidence for stochastic star formation in the first galaxies. And this was already before actually GWST because cosmological simulations of the of radiation have not been predicting very time variable and strongly feedback based related star formation histories. Here I show you an example of the uh, set of simulations of people organization galaxies. And what also we predicted in cosmological simulation is that low mass galaxies, since they have shallower potential wells, are those that are automatically and naturally more affected by the sparsiness and by feedback process in general. And as a consequence, we also predicted, in fact, that this low mass galaxy could also potentially be uh, quenched totally due to dark system formation as well. And surprisingly, uh, I mean, not surprisingly, but uh, uh, it was a nice thing to see among the first WST uh, results the fact that the very first low mass quiescent system have been detected. Uh, with an example from the Jade survey by using the very first Freshie 7 quiescent galaxy. And in general, uh, high redshift GWST observations are uh, going toward probing a very wide range of star formation rates for high redshift galaxies, especially for the low mass. And the effect of these wide ranges is exactly the uh, scatter in the UV luminosity. But up to now, all the models that have been taken into account the scatter in the UV luminosity have mostly been uh, assuming a constant scatter with the halo mass. 
But if we uh, agree that maybe low mass scalars are more likely to be affected by bar system formation, it is more likely to look at something like something like this. So increasing at lower halo masses. And this is exactly the hypothesis that I'm going to explore. So I want to understand the impact of a mass dependent steel bis capital in, uh, in high uh, observables and to understand if we can probe stochastic star formation through GWST observations. So how did I do that? Uh, this is all theoretical and this is all through a very simple analytical model. So consisting in just a few formulas that really allow us to easily test the effect of this mass dependent scattering. Let me go through the few assumptions of this analytical model. Uh, basically, we assume that the sigma UV, so the scatter, decrease with the halo mass uh, in that way, which is also consistent with the uh, simulations, like with the fire simulation, which maybe Jason can, can remember talk about uh, in more details. And the other key uh, ingredient of this model uh, is that we assume both the scatter in the UV uh, magnitude and also the star formation efficiency of galaxies to depend only on the halo mass. So we do not put in any redshift dependence in these uh, parameters. There is no redshift dependence in the sky. In this way, we can then uh, express uh, through this formula the probability of a galaxy of mass MH to have a certain luminosity. And this is what got the, in the upper panel there. Basically, what that is telling us is that a galaxy of a given luminosity can actually be hosted by a wide range of halo masses if the stochasticity is in place. And I calibrated all of these uh, two edge observations on redshift 5. But the key things to keep in mind here is that even though there is no redshift dependence in the model itself, in a lambda CDM universe, we expect low mass halos to be more dominant towards the higher redshift. So we naturally expect to have uh, higher consequences, let's say, for this uh, mass-dependent model at the higher pressure. So this is, these are the ingredients for the model. Let's now go to the results to, uh, to look at what different observable uh, we expect to look like if we, put, if we plug in this formula. Let's start indeed with the luminosity functions that we can evaluate simply by plugging in that simple formula for, for the probability into the integral for the halo mass function. And this is what we get. So if dashed lines are the model without any scatter, while the solid line are the model with uh, the sigma UV mass dependent scatter. And while a redshift 5, uh, they match because it's where I calibrated it, we see that with the stochasticity, we get a naturally higher luminosity functions and towards higher redshift. So this is uh, kind of nice because this physical mechanism naturally reproduces higher abundances at higher redshift without putting any redshift dependence, but only a mass dependence. These are our predictions, but let's see what happens if we compare with the simulations, with the observations, sorry. And this is what we get. So basically, up to redshift 12, uh, the observation are matched really well, but you can see that a Rashi 14, even accounting for the UV scatter, we cannot reproduce uh, the, the observed abundances. There is this discrepancy at the very highest range. And this means that some additional mechanism is probably in place, and probably, as was suggested by many folks this morning by Rachel, probably the star formation efficiency is not Rashi. Independent after all, but there is something from the high density that boosts the sublimation efficiency and high ratio. But the problem is that in general, luminosity functions are sensitive to different processes like sublimation efficiency, so it's easy, so they are intrinsically degenerate. So it's difficult, impossible to use only the luminosity function to discern between the different processes. So what I believe. It is important to do is try to uh, look for other observables to understand what are the key observables that can help us understand and constrain stochasticity. 
And so I'll just go through uh, some examples to finish on different observables, which I think are important. Um, first of all, the realization is true. Because if galaxies undergo vast evolution with up and downs in the star formation rate, we naturally expect that during the burst, probably they have a higher ionizing boson budget reduction. And so I did this test to understand the uh, possible implications. So I assume that the galaxy upscattering in the relation has an, an escape fraction of one, while I uh, put all the rest to zero. And what we get is that with this assumption, if we check the uh, evolution of the neutral fraction uh, of each one in the IGM, we can um, reproduce nicely an end of the book of organization by redshift suits as suggested by observations. Another quantity, I don't have time to go into details, but another quantity that will be naturally affected by histocasticity is the clustering of galaxies, which is usually um, quantified to a bias, which basically is a measure of how well the uh, galaxy traces the underlying uh, dark matter halo distribution. And if we increase the stochasticity, the bias gets lower. And uh, we can quantify uh, this once again by simply plugging in the probability. And we get this evolution. So once again, you see there is a difference between the no scatter dash and the scatter model. And this difference with the stochasticity is expected to get higher naturally towards the higher ratios. So hopefully, with uh, observations and new, new wide surveys that are actually found with GWST will be possible to do constraint on this one. Uh, finally, one last uh, physical quantity that I think is important to keep an eye on is the spectral feature of galaxy. So here I show you just a simple example of three different star formation histories and corresponding SCDs of galaxies that have different histories but have the same MUV. So these are redshift 10 galaxies with the MUV minus 20, but they have different visa slopes and different boundary rates. So uh, a, um, a natural outcome of stochasticity will be broader ranges of these quantities, so visa slopes and boundary rates for populations and high redshift at the same magnitude. And yes, with this I conclude. I just want to Say that the same way pointed that I believe that now there are increasing evidence for stochasticity of star formation and high redshift. And it has been proven, for example, that by the presence of YS and two mass galaxies, and that with a simple analytical model with the scatter decreasing with the halo mass, we can really easily predict a number of, um, uh, of quantities that can really help us constrain the effect of stochasticity on high pressure. And this is in preparation, but will be up soon, hopefully. So stay tuned. Thank you. We don't understand that these galaxies uh, have AGMs. Why is this? Change by the Can you uh, No, I cannot reject <laughs> the AGN hypothesis uh, for two reasons actually. One is that now I just put theoretically this uh, scatter in the UV uh, luminosities due to uh, the stochasticity in the star formation rate, but we do not actually know what drives this stochasticity. It's most likely internal cellular feedback processes, which can be, yes, supernovae mostly, uh, uh, winds, but also AGM can also cause this. And uh, yes, now I didn't have time to go into the details, but in my uh, paper of last year, when I analyzed the uh, quiescent Roman's galaxy that have been observed, which is this one, uh, by looking at the time scales of the star formation histories. So this is, the observations of the quenched Lomas galaxy. If we try to reproduce a spectra with the star formation histories, we get that we need a very abrupt quenching to reproduce the uh, SCDs. And this abrupt quenching means that the uh, feedback processes going on needs to be fast processes. 
So an again goes away. <laughs> there is probably or it could be radiation pressure, but I think they're not out of the picture. So an ongoing theme is how the UV luminosity will be met to a given star formation rate. That depends on some things again, the stellar population levels. And you know, a blood redshift where everything is sort of normal, we can put a plus sign, but it becomes more and more important, right, when you get to the highest redshift. So what is the strategy for controlling all the uncertainties and how solar evolution may or may not change? Because of the conditions that we're seeing in high Russia. Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer. I mean, it's a very <laughs> hard question, and I'm, yeah, I would like to know the best strategy. But what I think is that maybe uh, what I'm trying to do is to try to form our models from the theory, starting simple. So, putting one thing at the side. So, most uh, because I started with cosmological simulation, which has a lot of ingredients and a lot of complications. This is why I'm going in, let's say, backward and trying one thing at a time and to change, like before, the, just the mechanicities and IMF and stuff and see how we expect them to affect. And for instance, in this example, indeed, I saw that changing the metallicity of a high redshift CD doesn't make much of a difference. So maybe that's uh, an ingredient, but yes, the IMF is another <laughs> thing to be modeled and tested, but the strategy I'm trying to uh, look forward now is going to set one thing at a time, keeping it simple and predicting um, distribution. So, growth with the larger samples when we can say distribution of one thing like the beta slopes and the palmer uh, breaks, and maybe for the distribution we can just look for each. Okay, excellent. Um, I think we're ready to move on to the next speaker. Okay, so we next have Michael Bravo telling us about. Um, Nemlicity gradient, sorry, not gradient, but nemlicity enrichment in the cycle. Thank you. Yes, the first the title was uh, mechanism of outputs, how it's changed. So, method enrichment in the binary cycle, I will still be talking uh, mostly about outputs. Okay. So, the binary cycle is uh, referred to the gas flows. The of that gas flows that occur in and around that. We can actually observe the binary cycle by measuring the metallicity in the different stages of the cycle. So if we have inflows of metal for gas, this gas will go into the galaxy, into the ISM, and form stars. Eventually, the stars will go into supernova and eject very metal rich gas. Some of this gas will leave the galaxy entirely and then reach the super galactic medium. And some of this gas will fall back into the galaxy. And if we can measure the metallicity of the inflows, the ISM and the outflows, we can get the metal flow targets, which are an essential ingredient in any galaxy evolution model. Now, this is what we refer to as the large scale bias site. And it explains some observations like the mass of the galaxy. But there is another aspect of the binary cycle, which is the smaller scale bias site. So if we zoom into this region where supernova are being created, we would see this region of carved out material or super bubbles. And it is at these scales where the very metal rich supernova effect that gets mixed with this wrong ISM. Now, if we want to study both the large scale and the small scale of the variant cycle, we need a robust metallicity, uh, robust way to measure metallicity. So the widely used strong light method is probably not suitable for regions far away from H2 regions like outputs and inflows. So we want something like the direct. So the direct method uses aurora lines to measure the electron temperature of the gas and then the metallicity. And what I'm showing you here is work from Canada and Region 1. We use uh, Higgs-Hilbert observations to map this galaxy. 
and they found strong emissions from the old fleet for the GCC 3 on row 1, far away from the disk of the skies. This was quite a breakthrough because usually our lines are very faint and not detected outside the dark. So they were able to measure the metallicity uh, outside of the disk with this conservation. And here I'm showing you the metallicity map. So the galaxy lies here, edge on, and you can see that we observe very high metallicities or higher metallicities in the edges of the minor axis of this galaxy and the lowest metallicity along the major axis of this galaxy. And this is consistent with the picture that I was telling you about metal core inflows and metal reach outflows. Now, these results were great because this was the first time that we were able to see and map the whole body cycle for a single galaxy using a self consistent method. And we wanted to take this study further, and this is for other galaxies. Now, in order to apply this method to other galaxies, we need a few conditions. So, the galaxies need to be star bursting, so we have a cleaner outflow. They need to be close enough so we can um, separate the disk from the outflow, and they need to be metal core so we can detect the outer one. So this is NGC 2039. This is the nearest low metallicity starburst galaxy, which is the perfect target to continue this study. So we observed this galaxy with three KCWI pointings that you can see here, two on top of the, the disk of the galaxy, and there is a superstar cluster right there in our field of view. And a third one along the minor axis on top of this bright H alpha ultra filament. So, what I'm showing you here is our results uh, on the metallicity map. And uh, all these results are on a paper that was recently accepted and published in the archive last week. And you can see here from the map that we are able to measure the metal metallicity almost of any field, for the exception of some spikes of field far away from the disk. And I can tell you right now that this map looks very fast in comparison with the one of Cameron's work. And I will tell you more about what this means for the large scale viral cycle. But first, let's look at the smaller scale viral cycle. So, here is a zooming region around the star cluster. And here on the right, I'm showing you the metallicity map of this region. And you can see we have these two pockets of high metallicity around this region. Here on the left, I'm showing you an HFT image of the H alpha of the stellar condition of the same region. And you can see we have this uh, region with low emission around the star cluster that you can see there. So we have this super bubble around the star cluster. And what we think is going on here, uh, if, if you look, these uh, regions of the super bubble are uh, aligned with these regions of high metallicity. So what we think is going on here is that heat flux from the uh, superstar cluster is blowing away the gas, and what we are seeing in the metallicity is the direct supernova event, which is very metal rich. So we can also measure the electron density from the O2 uh, doublet emission, and if you, uh, what I'm showing you here is the map of the electron density around this region. If you would look at the entire map, you can see that most of those spikes fall below the low density region. However, this region around the star cluster has uh, an electron density that's more than two orders of magnitude higher than the rest of the disk. So, what we're seeing here is very high pressure, high metallicity gas around the star cluster. And we actually do see in simulations pockets of a uh, high pressure in uh, super bubbles, and we're really curious to know uh, how what simulations have to say about the enrichment in these regions. So, if anybody has an insight or comment on that, please. Um, and now let's go back to the large scale viral cycle. So, here again, I'm showing you the metallicity map of our entire field of view, and as I told you, it looks very flat in comparison to the work of Cameron that I showed you before. And here on the top, I'm showing you the metallicity pocket on the minor axis, so in this direction of the galaxy. And it's surprisingly, not surprisingly, very flat. So we can compare these results with close box simulations of outflows from Minerdan and Orbiting study group. So here on the right, I'm showing you the results for the simulations uh, for a galaxy with initial metallicity similar to the one of NGC. So here I'm showing you the metallicity profile along the outflow for those simulated outflows. And you can see the profile is relatively flat, which is consistent with 
I want to make sure that we give the uh, and you might be wondering what about cameras we saw because they did saw uh, they did saw um, they saw uh, radiance along the minor axis in high intensity at the edges of the outer. So actually, that galaxy is a lower metallicity than MC 1559. And if we look at the simulations for a galaxy with lower metallicity, we see that they, uh, the simulations also show a skipper profile for lower metallicity galaxies. So both or the way galaxies uh, are consistent with this going for the simulations of output. Now, what about the metal loading of these galaxies? So what I'm showing you here is uh, a plot of the metallicity of the outflow divided by the metallicity of the ISM uh, with respect to the stellar mass of the galaxy. In black, I'm showing you results from Chisel and 2018, where they use absorption lines to measure the metallicity of the outflow. And here in magenta, you have our two rare results that were made using direct metallicity. And you can see that our two results consisted with the higher mass end of the Chisel sample. And um, now from this, we can measure uh, metal outflow, outflow rate, which we have to assume a mass outflow, outflow rate, which we take from a final 2019 that they made using a given chart of observation. And here in the bottom uh, panel, I'm showing you those results. The two lines show theoretical uh, metal outflow rates that are needed in order to reproduce the mass metallicity relationship in two samples. So again, you can see that all two the uh, measurements are very consistent with the uh, uh, models. Now, this is only two galaxies that would have uh, measurements using the direct method, and I would like to have more. Uh, but as I told you, we need very specific properties of galaxies in order to be able to apply this method. So we have uh, some time in extruder to observe five more galaxies. And we have four more targets, and that will give us a number of nine galaxies that we were able to plot in this plot and a bigger sample. So, with that, I will leave you with a few slides. Thank you. Very interesting. So there's an old paper by Crystal Mark and I'll you 1569 that measured the metal of the hot gas. Yeah. And I think um, worth thinking about because models and simulations imply that most of the metals are actually in the hot phase. So if you're only looking at the metal budget in the form of gas, yeah. you may be underestimating fully. Yeah, yeah, we're aware of that paper. Yeah, we, we haven't made like the rest of our Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting one. I was wondering about the uh, high density region, the contours. Of the high density region align exactly where the enriched gas is. So I'm wondering whether that high density is enabling the output of the those channels or is it preventing the end? Yeah. Yeah, no, they don't like perfectly. Um, yeah, they they yeah, I, I don't have like an interpretation for that. Yeah, this is both on NGC 5053. So these two links in there is with these high density pockets to prevent some of the enrichment methods. So, for example, it's for that. We have theoretical evidence that the metals are coming from the absolute center. For example, you see an output from the cluster, something like that. We do see, like, Higher velocity dispersions that are coming from the position of the cluster. 
but it's hard to say without having like uh, a map of the whole galaxy. Like this is only like a small part of the galaxy. There are other star clusters that are outside of the so it's hard to say without. And then we do have follow-up observations to observe the whole galaxy. Okay. Great. 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 Um, so about the super star cluster, can you remind the age? So this star cluster is around 10 mega years old. Okay, and um have uh, have you compared the metallicity of the stars of that super star cluster to the that enhanced uh, material? No, so I haven't looked at the stars. I don't know if it's possible with our from like higher yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, we have the red name, the red name is like horrible. I don't know. It's too yeah. um, it, Just, I was curious because there were other clumps of like enriched material in your map, map yeah. right? So I was seeing how the metallicity of the star compared to our I wonder if this variation in density can really affect the measurement metallicity because also it's like a 200 something. But also, I don't know if some kind of other shock can be there affecting oxygen too. It would be nice to have sulfur too, or do you want to see if there is something there that is the sulfur is also affected? Maybe we can see there. Also, the density. So, we did incorporate the electron density into our, our metallicity. And yeah, the, the difference we get in metallicity is significant. It does not affect the name of all the other types of metallicity. And about the shocks, we do not have the emission lines to prove whether there are shocks in this region or not. So, All right, wonderful. That was very exciting. Um, so we can go ahead and have break. So Grace Talbert is here today. She's going to be telling us about the house. You can cite some seller feedback um, in the H2 digit and the LP. Thank you. We're warning at these minutes. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to round out our first afternoon together with, again, strong New Jersey representation <laughs> and really zooming in on individual stars and H2 regions in very nearby galaxies. And the goal is to understand how feedback from massive stars is deposited on very local scales. So, you know, we've already heard today that the first two years of JWST observations have unveiled this population of very low metallicity, chemically unevolved galaxies at high redshift that have some surprising properties. And there's a great deal of interest in the community in understanding how these galaxies contributed to the process of cosmic reionization. And so in these early galaxies, it's the metal core of stars that are dominating the feedback that regulates star formation. And also cosmic channels in the dense ISM through which newly produced ionizing photons from the hottest O-type massive stars can escape. And all of this is happening at very low metallicity. Now, to quantify the contribution of these galaxies to the ionizing photon budget at a high redshift requires a few model ingredients. So, we need to know the UV luminosity function at a high redshift, and we need to know the fraction of these newly produced ionizing photons that can escape from their host galaxy. And so these quantities are reasonably well constrained observationally. There are even newer measurements, and they'll continue to improve as we get more data from JWST and future missions. But it's this third parameter here, the ionizing photon production efficiency, which we need to calculate and 
stellar spectral and evolutionary models. And this becomes problematic at very low metallicities because below the 20% solar metallicity of a small Magellanic cloud, in order to find galaxies more metal poor than that that are still forming stars, we need to look at the edge of or just outside the local group. This is much farther away, so we can control stars are very faint and difficult to observe, and therefore we do not have very much observational data to guide our stellar models in this regime relevant for high redshift galaxies. So this is the gap I have been working to fill. And one particularly useful analog to these low metallicity star forming galaxies at high redshift is this nearby galaxy Leonine. It's just 3% solar metallicity. It has only one known O star that's powering this immense H2 region. And so it's an unusually simple situation that turns out to be useful for testing various model predictions. And so before I talk about the H2 region, I want to start with what we know observationally about this low metallicity massive star that's powering it and other stars like it. So the star LP26 here is part of a sample of three main sequence O stars that I've been working on for the past few years. These are in three galaxies just outside the local group, uh, spanning three to 14 percent solar metallicity in terms of their gas phase oxygen abundance. So our team observed the far ultraviolet spectra of these three stars using the cost instrument on Hubble. And for these hot and massive stars, the far UV is really critical because it contains important diagnostic information. So, for example, in this wavelength range, uh, we have a forest of iron transitions. So you can see it most easily in the bottom spectrum, which is the most metal rich of the three stars. But then if you look at the lower metallicity stars, you see a very featureless continuum. So we're getting empirical constraints on the opacity of iron to both UV and ionizing photons in these low metallicity stellar atmospheres. The UV also contains important diagnostics of stellar winds, which have a big impact on the evolutionary pathways of massive stars and also impact the shapes of their ionizing spectra. So the effect of the stellar wind can be seen most easily, again, in this bottom most metal-rich star spectrum, this broad blue-shifted absorption. So the depth of this feature encodes the mass loss rate, and the blueward extent tells us the terminal velocity. But so you can see, looking at the two lower metallicity stars here, these wind features become much weaker. And so empirically, we see that these must be driving very weak stellar winds. And finally, uh, I can use the shape information in the moderate resolution far UV spectra to model the profiles of the observed photospheric absorption lines. And I measured the projected rotation speeds of the three stars this way. So my measurements are these vertical black lines. And for comparison, the colored lines here are showing the cumulative distribution of observed V sine I of similar types of O stars in the more metal rich FMC. And so it, that's a 20% solar. And so we can read off from this plot that the two low metallicity stars here are rotating faster than 90% of similar stars in the SMC, which is really the first empirical evidence we have that, that fast rotation is quite common at these low metallicity. And again, this is important because fast rotation will induce additional mixing, which boosts surface temperatures and may sequence lifetime, and therefore boosts overall ionizing photon production by these stars. So to summarize this first part, I showed you evidence that these low metallicity O stars have both very weak winds and fast rotation, and both of these uh, properties really should be accounted for when we are modeling low metallicity stellar populations, both in the nearby universe and at high redshift. And now all of these results I've shown so far are from a small sample of three stars. And I just want to advertise that we have a new Cycle 31 Hubble Space Telescope large treasury program that is working to increase the sample available to us. So tempos or the treasury of extremely metal poor O stars is going to increase the number of far UV spectra of these low metallicity O stars by a factor of 10. So we'll be in a position uh, when data collection is complete at the end of the year to really rigorously calibrate stellar models at 5 to 10% solar metallicity. Now, 
all of this uh, information that we get from the far UV spectra is powerful, but it is an indirect constraint on the ionizing spectrum of the stars. And so let's focus now on this low metallicity star in Leo P, where we actually can do a more direct measurement of this ionizing spectrum. Because again, it's in this H2 region powered by just one ionizing star. And so I observed this galaxy with the KCWI instrument on Keck. Um, and again, you see the H2 region is very bright feature here. And this is an integral field unit spectrograph. So in each pixel in that image, I actually have a full optical spectrum. And so if I sum up all of the spectra in this blue circle contributing to the flux in the H2 region, I get this nice integrated 1D spectrum of the H2 region where we can see both you know, the stellar absorption features, the broad Balmer absorption there. So we are seeing the ionizing O star, but in this talk, we're more interested in this nice suite of nebular emission lines that we observed. So this is wide range of metal ions that uh, are different useful gas diagnostics. And so we can use this information to constrain things like the extinction and temperature in the nebula. And with those measurements in hand, I can then use the observed H beta luminosity to calculate the ionizing photon production rate from the star that's required to produce the spectrum that we observe. So I come up with this number. I then compare to the expected ionizing photon production rate from a purely theoretical stellar spectral model that I drew from the T lefty O star 2002 grid. Uh, this is widely used in stellar population synthesis codes and one of the only grids that goes down to 3% solar metallicity. So I fit this model spectrum to the observed far RUV through near infrared uh, observed SED of the star. And I find consistency within the uncertainties on the measurement from the KCWI data. And so this is a really nice validation of this model at just 3% solar metallicity and the first time that we've made it necessary to do this type of test. And so this measurement is really telling us about the normalization of the star ionizing spectrum, but we have a lot more information here, right? We have observed nebular emission lines from many different metal ions that require different amounts of energy to produce. And so I can use that best fit spectral energy distribution model as the ionizing source in a cloudy photoionization model and predict the nebular emission that we should observe given what we know about the conditions in the gas. And I actually found that uh, the observed intensity of this full suite of nebular emission lines relative to the H beta luminosity is actually consistent with this prediction from the cloudy model. And I checked that you know, different models with variations in stellar properties or ionization parameter in the nebula do not do a better job. This is really the best match that we have to the observation. And so again, uh, these two different lines of evidence suggest that these theoretical spectral models are performing well for this massive star in the OP. So again, that is a really nice confirmation that the models are doing reasonable things for this one O star in this one nearby galaxy, right? So it's great, but I always caution that it's only one star, and we really do need to continue building up observations of these low metallicity O type stars so that we can properly calibrate our stellar models. And again, that is exactly what uh, the Tempos program is working to do. And we are building toward a reliable set of stellar models that we can apply to understand these processes in both local dwarf galaxies and galaxies in other regions. Thank you. Thank you. I was so impressed by the agreement we found between the, uh, I, uh, the ionization cascade that is quite accomplished and uh, this uh, ionizing spectrum that we found. But one of the other concerns uh, when we do this type of comparison is that a portion of the ionizing photons can be covered in the H2 region. Yeah. Uh, and 
it's clear we have demonstrated that this is not the case for this one case. But what about the other uh, uh, sources uh, in, in the other uh, in the larger project? Have you uh, done any estimate of what kind of activity you might have from that? So um, not all of the sources in the larger project are in the United States two region. I actually have not done a careful check to find you know, if there are any other undisturbed and like they might have a lower case fraction. It's possible that there are some in the data set, but it is a pretty rare situation. Sure, I will all Super follow up. So, what was that state? It is assumed to be that the H2 region looks spherical and high resolution HFT imaging. And uh, we have very strong detection of the lowest ionization line in sulfur 2. So, that basically suggests that ionizing photons are moving at all of the outer corners of the H2 region and it's not running in any strictly way. So it is an assumption and basically means that the ionizing photon friction would have been possibly even lower than it because of question about the um, stellar winds. So I thought that the strength of stellar winds was proportional to um, the rotation of the star, but you said that those O stars have extremely um, star winds, but then also very fast rotation. So that is very dependent on that velocity that is more important than um, the rotation. So, stellar winds is being proportional to the stellar rotation. It is true that if a star reaches critical rotation, then essentially it's shedding off its outer layers. Shedding off its outer layers. So, that is kind of a different kind of stellar wind. These are radiation driven winds, meaning that. Um, energetic radiation from the star is coupling to the outer layers of the atmosphere, pushing it away. It's mediated by metal resonance transitions. And so, if you have fewer metals in the stellar atmosphere, then your winds will be weaker. And again, this is connected to the rotation because winds are efficient at carrying angular momentum away from the surfaces um, of the stars. And so, if you have a weak stellar wind, then the star should be able to maintain a higher rotation. Oh, you can go ahead. See, uh, when we mapping, if I look closely, there's some smudge around the front part and other one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So it's not perfect agreement. This is the best model, though, out of all the variations that we tested. And you're right, the sulfur two lines are especially hard to match, but this is actually kind of a known thing. I think so. It's actually produced both ionization models that can consistently match the observed sulfur two lines. And honestly, I forget the details of the processes right now, but there are some specific things that are challenging with the model. We can talk about that later. Um, so I'm going to use the question chair prerogative to ask one last question today. So I, I have this big recollection of years ago when we were talking about this object is going to be in the H2 region and having a binary. Is it a, did that did that result evaporate? Did I dream that? <laughs> Sorry, it's possible. Okay, it's binary. We have not conclusively mm -hmm. ruled out a binary. Okay, and so there might be some also in your laboratory. Yeah, so that's a that's a good thing. Not it's a thing that we need to be mindful of yeah. and look for. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Natural school, yeah. Binaries are very common in these massive stars. We know this. There's all we can do is do our best to choose a clean sample of those single stars, but that is actually very challenging to do. And we really would want, you know, multi epic spectroscopy of all of these things if we wanted to pick out binaries. And that is very expensive. So maybe someday. <laughs> So without any other questions, I think our next is a discussion section. Um, so. so now we are having a discussion session uh, led by Chang Kim, along with our review speakers, Flexi Burkhardt and Daniela Gallagher.
idea how we're going to manage this. Uh, but of course, this world that we are for. And need to download. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think here, I'm not sure how this is going to go. So, we will let it remind everyone and then we ask everyone what is spoken about today. Oh, there's one new discussion. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of collected some of the questions raised over uh, during the uh, session, basically. Uh, maybe this is a pretty biased bit of ways. But yeah, so the yeah, I mean the basic was so starting from the Oedipus of uh, asking the where it was could that go or actually also the sometimes we say that when does feedback fail? So this is really kind of a thing that related to the question. I mean the feedback is there, there is feedback, and then really the question is whether this feedback affects a small scale GMC or it affects a galactic scale like the ISM. Uh, within the disk scale height, or actually it just kind of uh, immediately directly go to the product winds, maybe it can reach the cost of the and the IG. So this is a little more the question about uh, where all this feedback energy has spent and uh, actually which feedback failed where and when. And that's the kind of the question related to that, I think. And then there's also another question that uh, related to the um, feedback given problems kind of theme, I'm not sure whether uh, that was actually their kind of theme or not, but uh, we think the a lot of people thought that because the feedback injects such a lot of uh, local amount of energy, so feedback can be responsible for the driving the problems, but there is also large scale motion, large scale dynamics that can also um, affect the problems. But then now, the, when we talk about these problems in the theoretical point of view, and also compare this with observational uh, measurement, mostly we are talking about some kind of equation. And at that point, there are some complications there on uh, this equation. Whether are we really kind of the subjecting the regular motions uh, nicely, and then we can only be really left with uh, some end of motion that actually is responsible for the supporting pressure of something like that. So that's the uh, kind of the questions that always are uh, there. And then there's some question raised about the role of the building structures. So I think those are all kind of the questions related to the maybe uh, our current knowledge, mostly based uh, we learn those knowledge mostly based on the uh, some theory backed up by the local uh, detailed observation. But then now, I think the, this JWST era, I think the, really the, another key question we need to answer is, can this rosy wisdom be applicable to the highly galaxy or highly system? Or in other words, the normal self-moving galaxy, uh, the thing that works in the normal self-moving galaxy can work in this case. Low relationship or low metallicity this represents the low metallicity system, also high sensitivity, high pressure system, and maybe there is some difference in the IMF, etc. So, and can we do this with some nice local analysis? Is there, are there any local analysis? I think this is another important question. So, and then the, finally, what are I mean, the future observations that we need to think about to really answer to this question, which maybe we can. Touch that later. So I think yeah, these are some questions that I raised. Uh, I mean, the big I collected. Do uh, anyone want to start uh, to give some thought? On this? So uh, can I start in the order? No problem. Oh, okay. So. I'll say something there for a lot of it because today we learned a lot of stuff about normal supporting galaxies. But when I think of high pressure, high efficiency in supplementation, 
and the Father of God, the moment that we see the Ahim Tawbah, step over the doors. And we, we have purpose, and we have heard some uh, talks about step over the doors, but I think more of the karma. I think those are probably the ones that we want to look for, for potential analogs. Not so much at N51 or the Milky analogs, those are not going to be together. But the ones that are a, a low a mass of metallicity today, they sometimes contain uh, nuggets of very high density, high efficient transformation, uh, when they have been discovered that uh, high density nuggets uh, and efficiency of transformation that. Uh, can talk to 60% uh, from measurements. So that's possibly a place where I will start moving. And uh, this is just a, a, a provocative thought. I hope someone will uh, review my statement. Review the statement. <laughs> well, I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> and, and you know, morphologically, morphs are be either thick. They have a high ratio of losses per into the rotation speed. They look very much like high ratio galaxies. For about the same reason, the ratio of, say, to the gene's length to size is high. And then now we can only go so far because that high ratio is very much higher density. So everything happens much, much faster. Or it's been just, you, know, you can have a clump of four stars for 100 years, million years or more. And then you get a certain kind of feedback. So feedback is Depends on density. Some things depend on density, but, but the, I agree completely with the things you say. In some respects, when you both are very good. So, what is the actually the main challenge of observation of science? Just because they are small. I mean, the hands give a lot of patience for those normal experiments, and then. The reason why, why we can, can do that uh, for the uh, the true analogs to hydrogen galaxies have not been found in the local universe. We have searched the entire SDFS, and we find a good candidate for the one for example, the green people that don't fully overlap with the properties of high ratio galaxies. So there if they exist, they are rare. Just to follow up with that, uh, it's a little bit about your regime to think in general, these are just like the one that's again to like the top of the stars, it's mostly a high ratio. So I think in one way we are biased to, towards the most extreme and most transforming galaxies. There's also from simulations or the battery model represented, we do expect also population of uh, I guess and those transforming galaxies that have been crunched, but those we would call similar big them because they are too thin. So I think we need to keep in mind that maybe we are the same people. Yeah, so that's great. Cool. Yeah. I think the we also record for the when I kind of go through this uh galactic outflows studies, people always show the M82 as a standard example, but this is actually the extreme case with uh rather than um the, the lower and outflows that you always see from the, kind of the those type of stars. There are lots of the kind of things the lower hidden things that were and we need to really understand the full population. Maybe yeah, we need to understand them first <laughs> before really understanding this problem. Actually we need to be more. <laughs> Actually, the next thing that I see about that, I'm thinking back at a couple of talks about the one that is specifically on bursting as a formation and high shift. So that actually to me describes a really a dwarf galaxy. You don't find something like that in a larger spiral. You need them somehow a, to have the possible supplementation sporadic. And uh, bursting in in a fits and, and stuff. But the, I still remember the straight at home by 2017. And by since the first order, they were saying that the uh, dual galaxies are from two to the for And I'm sure there are plenty more recent people that are from that. 
So can we put together a list of where the local analogs don't fit for our interest? Ones like you were saying, they don't really fit. Where where don't they fit specifically? It just it depends. If you can find things, it depends on the mass group and, and the diversity and starvation region that you're trying to look at in high redshift population. So you can find cases, I think, that might match some of the high redshift allocations and just not in the SDS. But that that would be even a spectroscopic SDS of some of the other of the I what so what properties? So it's it's the when you get down into the low mass. I, I think about this because it, in the context of the mass relativity to star formation rate, it planes, and you can't actually very well measure the evolution of that plane because the high redshift galaxies and the low redshift galaxies are in a different part. So I'm just going to start with extrapolation for you. But like low, low masses and high star formation rates. That's the problem. And I think another important thing about the dwarf galaxies, even if they have extreme conditions, uh, the star formation histories of a low redshift galaxy to find one that formed all of its stars in the past 100 or 200 million years, like some of the high galaxies. I think that's something that's very difficult to find in the universe of 13 billion years. So, right? so I think that's an aspect. But many of these galaxies we observe at high redshift are. 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses. So just by stellar mass alone, they don't match up with the dwarf galaxies. JWC would go to lower masses, but we're not observing 10 to the 6 solar mass dwarf galaxies and, and high redshift with great detail. So I think that's also a challenge. Yeah, we have another question. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a fundamental caveat to that following from what Ryan said. Uh, the iron enrichment in the local dwarf galaxies is going to be much higher than a high redshift because you've had time for your type 1a supernova to go off and cause higher enrichment. And so the solar atmospheres are going to have higher opacities and you're going to have more intense feedback. So you're not going to see suppression of feedback like you do at higher. That's going to be critical. Thank you. 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 When you look at the stellar populations of the field, when you just look at the stars that formed so long ago, they are as old as the few globular clusters those galaxies have. You'll see that the masses of the globular clusters almost completely dominate all of the stars at the time when the globular clusters form. So there is evidence for those massive stars at early ridges. In the meantime, you have all this other stuff that's going on at modest star formation rates, which fills in. With this and with low mass stars today. But the local galaxies can tell us about high redshift dwarf or small galaxies. If you look at the old stuff. It's one thing we'll hear a lot more about later in the week is the importance of the TM IGN system. Because there's no way, that's one thing you can never get an analog for. Like if you go past redshift six, the IGM is very patchy. Reionization up to fully neutral, and how galaxies are forming in that neutral IGM, and really find it with low redshift. I think the one thing maybe so anyway, if it's, it is impossible to find the local analogs, then the studying uh, like uh, the detailed observational study of this high redshift galaxy maybe uh, is. So then you may want to rely on the theorists. So then I think the, the might be the question is if the given the condition are similar, like uh, if we can actually put this kind of condition like low mechanistic loads of uh, high possibility, high pressure um, state, can you actually model this ISM and the star formation model well in the universe? You want to have a comment? I mean, it's basically asking the is the physics basically the same in the higher in the lower? I hope so. <laughs> I'll just quickly add that a lot of the simulation I showed in my review talk were divorced from the cosmic context. 
right? So they weren't cosmological self-consistent to me. A lot of them are individual GMCs or they're individual, you know, isolated galaxies. And so I think at the high redshift it becomes even more and more important to include the cosmic baryon accretion uh, from a lambda CDM pick. Yeah, I guess uh, a bit, a little more, uh, a more optimistic view on that. I think the way to look at this is not that you need um, conditions that are exact in terms of the higher of the galaxy and the lower of the floors, but rather look at it uh, more systematically. Things like, you know, like, like Bruce was saying, you have patches of high sub density efficient star formation. So that's a systematic thing you can look at. That's similar in these this context. And Grace talked about looking at uh, low uh massive stars. So again, the way to do this would be more systematically and in simple step by steps, rather than looking for an exact analog and kind of mass things that works in every parameter. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, we can also discuss a little bit more uh, about the, our current wisdom uh, at the lower level, but we can continue what's the next next on the agenda. Okay. So I just wanted to add that um, to me, as the results of talking to the global challenge, as long as we um, the satellite evolution models and then the star atmosphere model working and low metallicity, and that's one of the fundamental tools that we're using to work on from whatever redshift. So I think as a local, yeah, we don't need to look at the exact complex to understand what's going on uh, with work on in a first way that work. Stellar population uh, or stellar evolution model and the stellar population synthesis model are the base tools that we uh, use. Uh, and I mean, it is included in the grid show that there was a little bit of the model and the opposition. So we may get it close evidence, more, more evidence comes in and also more concept there, then we can actually have some confidence tool that we can use to model the population or the exchange condition. Add more problems. I think the issue here is that it's not focused on, on the individual things that we discuss at high ratio. But I think there are new papers now coming up, right? Saying once you have these extreme conditions, you have produces so much ionizing photons. If you take a local analog FSK fraction, that the universe will be ionized by uh, an average of six or five, which is already like at high ratio, like seven or eight minutes. So you need to have other conditions in a cosmological context to put these things together. Um, but that's one thing we haven't touched with also the classic galaxy that we are finding redshift three to five now. I think there's at least two galaxies that I know so far that has formed around 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 solar masses or on redshift 10 to 11 because we see the reconstruction of star formation history like these under some conditions, right? So how do these things also fall into the larger picture become Order to address uh, and how they quench that are, I guess, in another level of HDM. Yeah. There will be extensive discussion on HDM on Friday. So I was just going to say, in the context of looking for extreme events at low metallicity. When you look in the local universe, there are lots of interacting galaxies. Most of what we're studying is the high surface plate and the regions. But in the very outer disks of those things, the metallicity is quite low. A lot of times the star formation is being triggered at very high density by the collision. So there may be some interesting analogs about how the energy gets out of those star forming events at very low levels. Follow up a little bit on that. Something that's important to remember at high redshift is that mergers are going gangbusters. So you have 
it's not like you have a merger and then the galaxy nicely settles down and then you might have a merger later. It's, it's basically, I don't know if anyone else would think that moment can be but that's sort of what I think about it. And so when we're talking about sort of low rotation analogs and high rotation galaxies, I think it's important to remember exactly how high in that grid the merger rates are during the first year. So maybe related to these ideas where we use uh, an analytic model to interpret the data and understand whether uh, feedback dominates the two points. So can it be somewhat positive model to assume equilibrium? And I guess we know that white galaxies or energy galaxies spend a lot of the time on equilibrium for the equilibrium. And so yeah, for the standard galaxies, how can we move forward to sort of feedback in isolation there are there's a good chance that agents exist like all over the place uh so the question that i would like to ask here is that what do you think like in the future operations perspective like in 10 years we will, will be still be discussing what is the contribution of the level emission from star formation within the agm do you think like obviously degrees like gws here or, or so on like will they be able to answer that question in the near future or not and uh, uh one other advocate for block galaxies could be that there are both galaxies with the in there. So can we use them to distinguish between this contribution from star formation versus the ADM in those, you know, not local analogs, but then using them to answer what we can, we can achieve that higher shift or not. So I don't think we're going to find kind of real local analogs that have all the properties. And so it's it's kind of like I think what we need to do is study different kinds of galaxies that have some of the problems. I mean, you're saying low metallicity dwarf. Great. We need high pressure in collisions. Uh, and, and so it's like we need to have ADMs or whatever. So it, it, we're learning something new about physics from each of them. And as we get that closer and closer to reality, we may have a chance of, of figuring out the early universe. High pressure, that works, I think, return to you. To you. Not a chance. <laughs> 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 high gas, high pressure uh, in regions, not across in their body, uh, and they have uh, ice isolation efficiency, but they don't have a chance, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is this for the high risk, uh, in, even the high risk, like a first hand? Oh, yeah. yeah. When I mean high risk, it means over six or seven. 
So in that version, that was the last of the Asian period. Yeah, already. Yes. So for some local courts have five open. So I think we're discussing a lot of uh, linking like local university to I rash, but now nowadays I rash is a bit big, but I would, I would say we change to have rash is kind of different I rash, but still, uh, it's like we are forgetting whatever is in between. So, for example, I mean, we heard a little bit today about cognitive galaxies, and there we know that, uh, for example, they are very turbulent, gas rich, uh, clumpy, and that surely is not what we should talk as well. So, that would be. Uh, see at cotton moons where we know it we got with a commercial cash so I guess it's something worse than it's known. You know, so uh, as far as I know it's very difficult to find such kind of Irish uh, galaxies locally. Uh, and at the same time I feel like uh, at least from the observation point of view nowadays with James Webb and Alma uh, I think it's at rich studying at small scales cosmic moon galaxies and the subformations of I want to five five galaxies to one Massive galaxies to be built. Clusters uh, are some paper, but they are seen not exactly for uh, galaxies, but uh, they state them is that uh, talk to them. They say that uh, they don't see these uh, smaller galaxies in GS, whereas if you look at the actions of the Surprising uh, galaxies from 300 to 400 billion years after Big Bang to be masses than mine. Then you need some mechanism to accelerate the star formation. And what are different hypotheses? I, I will cover a flash talk in two minutes. Show how AGNs can influence star formation, not only by the uh, universe, but also in the nearby. Also in our cars, one of the micro points is clear now, we are sure, that uh, is uh, triggering star formation. And uh, what well, I will go in this flash talk of two minutes through all these observations. So for massive galaxies, you need some sort of mechanism that can accelerate the star formation. Otherwise, uh, not a CDM model cannot explain those masses from uh, the galaxies so early in the universe. So we need an astrophysical mechanism for black before start in the very early universe. Trigger of star formation and they are uh, uh, environments such very high densities. So we are talking about two types of different galaxies. I think that uh, the ionization of the universe started with the majority of the galaxies before stars. Most of the stars we know are current fraction of the system. And uh, one of these massive stars might go black hole black star. And then you have each 
I think we need to close. Uh, maybe uh, if there are any other comments and questions, last word. Status. Uh, really, the last word for the second set. We can wait for the next session. So thank you so much, everyone, for an amazing day for the Elster conference. Uh, so tomorrow we will meet uh, in Mueller. Uh, and also we'll have multiple discussion sessions. So we'll have another 30 minutes tomorrow, like two more 30 minutes tomorrow or so. Yeah, this is just to say that uh, today we didn't have many, today we didn't have talks about conflict, no, but tomorrow we'll go on showing more talks and more like this day, yeah, the game of the conference is on this, but multiple sessions. And one important thing, before you head to the reception, which is in the same area where you have lunch, please grab some coupons for two drinks in the place where you got the badges from. And for tomorrow morning, 8.30 breakfast uh, in Mudder. And the people with the post, with the people who have uh, physical posters tomorrow, they might have bring a poster with you, so you can uh, put it on the um, uh, auditorium walls. It will not Actually, in my single star, I'm going to start the set of points. 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 I'm going to start the set of points